Welcome to the tutorial on fact-checking, fake news, propaganda, and media bias. This tutorial will be thought by three persons, by myself, Giovanni San Martino uh, from the University of Padova, Prezav Nakov, and Firoz Alam from, uh, from the Qatar Computing Research Institute, uh, HBKU uh, Qatar. So anytime uh, you have any question, feel free to write them in the, in the chat. And as long as we are just a few participants, you can even interrupt us and uh, ask questions. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, let's start with, uh, with the main term in the, the most uh, known term uh, in our tutorial title, which is fake news. And so let's start to clarify what we mean by that. And let's start with a couple of, uh, of examples. Here, we, there's a, this piece of news says that uh, um, uh, there's a, an agenda to uh, behind the COVID-19. Uh, uh, the, and the idea is that uh, so Bill Gates is going to be uh, digital tracking us with the, with the virus. So this is a kind of, let's say typical conspiracy theory uh, story that probably most of us would uh, uh, account as fake news, would recognize it as, uh, as fake news. So when we have this kind of story, let's say it would be kind of uh, uh, easy. But then, okay, let's move on to this other, uh, this example here, which says that, uh, Trump delays Easter to July 15, and so on, uh, to keep promise on coronavirus. <clears throat> this uh, this piece of news is from uh, is from the Onion, so a satirical uh, uh, website. So, although uh, this uh, this news uh, this piece of news might be uh, might be fake, it's probably fake. This is not. Uh, like intuitively, you can think that this is not the same thing as the, as the previous one. And now we'll, let, let's try let's try to understand what what's different behind them. And basically, the the main difference that uh, that we can uh, recognize here is the fact that in uh, in this example, the intent of the satirical website is to uh, is to make us uh, laugh, while in the previous one. There might be an intent to manipulate, to uh, influence uh, our uh, our opinions, but if by fake news we only in, uh, we intend something that is false, they they both fall into the same category here, and we might wonder whether this is actually uh, the case. While this is actually a good idea, so let's dig into deep. Um, if we go to uh, to a dictionary, like the first thing to do when we want to um, understand better the, the meaning of, of a term, and if we go to uh, Merriam-Webster, we find uh, this definition. They basically uh, says that the term is self-explanatory, so they kind of avoid to give a precise definition, says that this is a composition of two terms news, so something reported in the, in the newspaper, and fake, something that is false. So both, uh, according to this definition, uh, both of the previous uh, uh, piece of news uh, would, be, uh, would be fake news. And so the, the, same, the same website goes on saying is that the term fake news has been around for a while, even in the 18th uh, century, we can find uh, its, uh, its usage. But uh, actually there is no consensus on, uh, on this definition and there are other, um, other, other people that may argue that actually the term fake news is, uh, is an oxymoron. So it's a contradiction, contradiction in terms because news, the news reporting is supposed to be true and factual. And having a fake news, then it's kind of like false, uh, uh, false news. Uh, it's kind of a contradiction in uh, in terms. So the two terms cannot just be put together as uh, as easily according to uh, to this definition. 
And if we go to uh, to other websites like the Collins one, uh, the definition is a little bit different and uh, says in this case it's false, often sensational information disseminated under the guise of news reporting. So it seems it like pretends to be news, but it's uh, it's false and sensational uh, uh, information. So the, here, the, there is an attempt, at least, to to give uh, uh, to give a definition. And uh, actually, fake news was one of the uh, was coined a, a term of the years by by Collins. So it was it was one of the most important. Uh, word in uh, all this uh, in all these years, and because it has uh, as we're going to see, he's had uh, consequences, practical consequences. Um, so let's uh, let's keep checking uh, our um, definition. Uh, the one from the Cambridge uh, Dictionary says that it's false stories that appear to be news and are uh, spread on the internet or other media. So we are mentioning the internet here. Uh, and and social media, uh, and this are usually created to influence political views or as a joke. So in this case, they are considering the two uh, the two cases that we have seen, the two examples. They they kind of recognize that they are different, they have different intent, but they still put them together under the same uh, uh, umbrella uh, definition. And um, also uh, the Wikipedia page has uh, um, uh, uh, stresses the role of social media and, uh, and the internet uh, to uh, the, the role that they play in the, the, in the development, uh, in the spreading of, uh, uh, of fake news. And they also mentioned the, the sensational aspect of them uh, by using the term clickbait here. <clears throat> well, some, uh, so you, as you can see, there are all these uh, different definitions that cover different uh, aspects. And also there are cases in which apparently uh, like the, uh, what is considered fake news is just uh, what we, don't like as news reporting. So it's, it's kind of, of, of a bias about our, um, regarding to our political views, for example. And on the, on the other extreme, uh, there's, a, mm, there's, there's been some, uh, like another way to uh, see at the, at the problem of the fine fake news is actually to avoid uh, uh, formally defining it. And this, has, uh, uh, this is a press, uh, precedent in the, um, in the uh, US Supreme Court uh, justice because uh, the same thing happened uh, with, uh, with pornography. In that case, the Supreme Court said that um, we don't need to uh, give a, a precise definition because people are able uh, of pornography because people are able to recognize it when when they see it. So again, they they consider this something that is so common that people actually it's, it's common knowledge how to uh, to recognize it. Uh, but actually, that doesn't really apply to um, to fake news. Because um, apparently uh, a lot of, uh, um, especially young people, have trouble uh, recognizing fake news, and this uh, this study commissioned by the, the European Commission uh, says that seventy five percent of young people don't are not able to recognize uh, fake news. So actually, there is a need to uh, uh giving a precise definition of the uh, of the term uh, fake news and uh what actually um since there are all these uh so since fake news is such a popular term that has been used in the, in many different contexts and even outside of uh, scientific uh context and there are so many different uh, definitions and so on instead of trying to come to change the definition of that uh, of that term, uh, what has uh, happened is that uh, many uh, 
um, many important uh, uh, large organizations, like again, the European Union, the uh, World Trade Organization, uh, they adopted different uh, term to, uh, to refer to the, the same problem. And that term is uh, disinformation. And uh, on the contrary, this term is uh, uh, precisely, uh, it's more precisely defined uh, than, fake, uh, than fake news. Uh, here there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, a sketch from uh, Crowd World or the first, uh, from the first uh, draft news that uh, um, uh, kind of give a, a, a good idea of the term uh, of the term disinformation. So there are uh, different type. Uh, so in in two words, disinformation is uh, is news that is false and but also that in, uh, has the intent to harm, to harm. Uh, and so in this case, if we go back again to the, um, to the original, to the two example at the very beginning, the one of the onion would, be, would not be disinformation because it, uh, we may argue that it doesn't have the intent to harm while, might be, uh, while the news was clearly uh, false. So uh, the term disinformation then it puts, uh, highlights these two, uh, both aspects. One, the uh, the truthfulness of, uh, of the news that we are reading, and in, uh, in our opinion, very importantly, uh, also the intent to harm that has a piece of news. So let's uh, then let's look at uh, um, at uh, uh, this uh, this sketch um, more into detail. There are actually three uh, three terms that are uh, expressed here. One is misinformation. That is, uh, that is a news that is, uh, uh, that is false, and, uh, but not, does not necessarily has the intent uh, to, uh, to harm. So for example, I might say something false, uh, uh, there might be a news report in which there's a, a count of the number of uh, uh, the unemployment rate, number of people unemployed in, in a country, and that number is slightly, uh, lower about a few tens of people, which doesn't really change the, the meaning. So in that case, that, that information would be, uh, would be false, but clearly would not have the intent to harm. So we would talk about uh, misinformation. On the, on the right side, we have the term malinformation, which is a um, piece of news that uh, has the intent to harm, but uh, in that case, it might not necessarily uh, be false. So, for example, if there are some uh, uh, know, some secret uh, email uh, that have been that are uh, published at, at the right moment, those email could actually uh, affect the uh, maybe you know, political candidate or something like that. So, these those email are true. The, the content might be uh, uh, actually true. But the point is that there is a clear intent to, to harm a person or country or, uh, or an organization in that sense. So when the two things are combined, so when something is false and he has the intent to harm, then uh, we talk about this information, so, which is the uh, union of the two terms. And we think that probably this information is the actual is is a term that is more suitable for uh, describing um, actually the the phenomenon that we are going to uh, to talk about uh, during uh, the rest of the of the tutorial. <clears throat> uh, still from uh, first draft, there are different. Uh, uh, forms uh, of uh, information uh, disorder. And so we can go a little bit into details and like split up that, uh, the preview, that previous sketch. And we can go from completely false fabricated content from completely fabricated from scratch uh, to false content pulled, um, to um, real content pulled, put in a false uh, context. Uh, to misleading context is so still true, but uh, written in a way that it's misleading, 
uh, making false connection or even just have uh, satire or parody. So um, there are different uh, levels of uh, what is called information disorder uh, that, uh, that might happen. So why is actually interesting talking uh, um, and actually trying to do something about, uh, about uh, fake news and uh, disinformation? Uh, there have been uh, allegedly some important examples uh, in which the, um, uh, the use of uh, false uh, of disinformation and like disinformation campaigns actually has had uh, practical consequences in um, the real life of people. For example, during the uh, 2016 uh, election, uh, something that uh, uh, has uh, allegedly has uh, happened. And the same thing is, uh, uh, it is considered that uh, fake news and uh, disinformation has had, uh, had uh, quite an uh, um, important uh, uh, role in the uh, in the Brexit uh, in the Brexit vote. So, so one of the reason uh, then to care is because it has this uh, could have these huge consequences because the idea is to um, is to be able to manipulate a, a lot of people. And actually, uh, Tim Berners Lee, the inventor of uh, uh, of the web says that actually in, uh, related to the previous two cases, says that Facebook um, uh, has, uh, has made uh, uh, the web kind of, of a web, has turned the web into a weapon, and especially uh, this related to the, um, um, to the spread of disinformation and disinformation uh, campaigns. So the fact that it has made this a weapon makes it very important to, uh, uh, it, the problem is very important to deal with. And this has had um, also like practical, uh, even uh, more uh, evident consequences. For example, uh, is um, here uh, <clears throat> is happened in India that according to fake, um, messages on WhatsApp, some people have been uh, killed because it was the um, were spread fake news that they did something really uh, horrible things. And then some people uh, reacted and killing the, and the, the people that were uh, thought uh, falsely accused to be responsible were, uh, have been uh, Indian killed. And so uh, even in the uh, 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 the violence uh, against uh, the uh, Rohingya has also, uh, a lot of people say that uh, um, the spread of this information uh, using Facebook has had a very important uh, role. Uh, besides, uh, besides that, there are also economical consequences uh, for example, uh, this is uh, uh, a case uh, in which uh, uh, the um, Twitter account of the Associated Press was uh, hacked and uh, like a false uh, news saying that there's been two explosions in the White House uh, have been, uh, uh, has been uh, posted as a tweet. And since Associated Press is a well-respected uh, uh, association, this has said uh, immediate con uh, economical consequences on the stock market. And you, you can see that he has been going uh, immediately down significantly. Of course, he has come uh, back up, but maybe some people might have uh, um, lost a lot of money in this, uh, in this process and while others might have gained, uh, earned quite a few, uh, money from it. Uh, so another consequence is the, um, is the health related uh, disinformation uh, that for example, as um, the, some disinformation spread by anti-vaxxers uh, has got uh, a lot of audience get quite uh, influenced quite a few people. And uh, there has been reported then uh, 
a lot of uh, measles uh, outbreaks. And there were country, some countries in Europe, like UK, Greece, Czech Republic, and Albania, that are no more uh, measles free. And this is due to um, a lot of people refusing to, uh, to, do, uh, to uh, do vaccine uh, to their children. <clears throat> Though, uh, actually, the, when COVID uh, spread out, first spread out, the World Health uh, Organization uh, released some, uh, some statements and says that we are not just fighting a pandemic, but we are uh, fighting an infodemic. So highlighting the fact that um, um, also the, uh, the um, controlling the, the way the information were, that were spread, uh, the right, uh, the correct information was spread was also uh, very important. Actually, when they listed the, the priorities of uh, what should be done to uh, uh, face the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, providing accurate information and fight the infodemic was at number two. So, um, so this is to stress that even the World Earth, uh, World, uh, World Health Organization was considering this to be uh, one of the uh, one of the priorities. Okay, now uh, so uh, I was uh, um, I was just mentioning uh, the fact that there has been uh, allegedly some uh, campaigns. Um, this information campaign during the 2016 US election or, or during the, the Brexit campaign. So now um, in this uh, next section, we're talking about uh, all these campaigns and we talk about uh, actually propaganda campaigns. So we introduce a new term uh, alongside fake news, disinformation, misinformation, and so on. And we see what are the tools to deal uh, uh, with uh, with it. Again, as usual, let's start. Uh, uh, let's start with a uh, with a definition. And let me just uh, read it, and then I'll comment it with you. So, propaganda is communication that deliberately misrepresents symbols, appealing to emotion and prejudice and by passing rational thoughts to influence its audience uh, towards a specific goal. So uh, as you can see here uh, in the, the definition of, uh, uh, of propaganda, there is the clear intent, uh, so deliberately to influence the audience towards a specific goal. So the intent in this case is to reach a specific, uh, to foster a specific uh, agenda. Uh, and uh, this definition is from the Institute for Propaganda Analysis. And actually, this is like a slightly re-elaborated. Uh, re actually, the part in blue uh, has been added, but it only explain uh, the part in blue explains how uh, the influence can be obtained. And uh, so there are basically uh, two, uh, two ways to so appeal to the motion of the audience or uh, by using, um, by passing rational thoughts or using uh, logical uh, fallacies. So one thing to notice uh, about um, uh, the definition of propaganda is that there is the, uh, there is a stress on, on the fact that there is a specific agenda that is being uh, trying to pursue, pursue, but it doesn't say that this has uh, not necessarily this has a heal uh, heal intent. Although we tend to associate the word propaganda to negative uh, to have a negative uh, connotation, but actually the definition does not necessarily have a negative connotation. For example, if you um, uh, if you look at the um, at these posters here, you can see uh, on the slides. Uh, I would say that, um, uh, for example, the one the one in the middle is for um, is about uh, 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 preventing lung cancer. So it's an advertisement campaign to prevent lung cancer, and in that case, I would. 
I could argue that the, the intent is actually uh, is actually a, a good uh, a good intent. And uh, the other two uh, the uh, the other two examples they are um, uh, examples of how uh, the influence can be reached. For example, the the one on the left. Uh, um, it says to buy war bonds before it's too late, so before your children turns into uh, we before uh, uh, turn into uh, Germans. Uh, so we before uh, we are invaded. This is a American uh, poster for uh, during World War II, and this is appealing to the fear of the uh, of the population uh, clearly. Okay, uh, so. What we want to talk uh, about today is uh, propaganda campaign that are uh, um, online propaganda campaigns. So that, that uses the internet and social media to uh, to do that. But let's uh, let's first uh, like give briefly a historical perspective uh, on uh, on them. Uh, so before before the internet, when we're talking about uh, propaganda campaigns, we were talking about the, the control, uh, uh, usually uh, governments, because uh, um, the governments were the only ones who could have the full control of a, of the mass media, and uh, having a propaganda campaign would require massive resources to. Uh, and like the control again of the uh, of the mass media, and what usually happened is that the propaganda campaigns were done from a government towards its own citizens. It was very seldom that propaganda campaign were done from a government from a country uh, towards another toward the citizens of another country because um, each country was kind of controlling more or less the, uh, the mass media so it was harder to penetrate uh, uh, effectively another country's uh, uh, mass communication so these are like uh, mainly the uh, uh, the aspect and uh, so whenever we talk about uh, uh, about propaganda so where does the term uh, fit into the previous um, uh, with respect to the to the previous one and to the pre the slide that we have seen uh, previously? It actually has a different um, because propaganda might not have uh, any heel uh, intent, so it might be uh, for a good. It doesn't really fit into. Uh, into the schema, so it's come. It's something that is kind of uh, uh, a bit orthogonal. So it's it's uh, it's again another uh, another dimension uh, of the uh, of the complex uh, problem. Okay, so we have seen how the traditional propaganda campaigns uh, were uh, were run. What were the the characteristics? But now, uh, now let's uh, let's introduce introduce the term um, computational propaganda, which was actually uh, introduced by uh, Bolsover and uh, Howard in a special issue in two thousand and seventeen, so very um, very recently, and they refer to computational propaganda as the um, as all those um, propaganda campaigns that are carried out. By exploiting techno uh, technological means like the social media, the internet, and uh, other things that we are going to uh, to see in the in the next minutes. Okay, so um, clearly, you know, with the with the advent of the internet and social media. Uh, what happens is that there, uh, the control of, uh, of, of a single country over um, uh, over its uh, it, the communication that happened uh, in the um, inside the country is uh, is uh, not always as uh, is not as effective, let's say, as as it was before. So uh, it, it is possible actually to have uh, um, propaganda campaigns that are uh, that are um, performed by um, 
people outside of, of a country towards that country. And this is what uh, allegedly has happened uh, with uh, Cambridge uh, uh, Analytica and the 2016 uh, election. So if we want to have a, a propaganda campaign exploiting uh, the internet, we actually uh, need a different, uh, a different uh, set of skills. So first thing is to, we need to be able to create uh, messages that uh, are able to persuade uh, the audience. And obviously the audience need to be uh, persuaded, we need to be influenced without realizing it. Because otherwise uh, the manipulation doesn't, might not really be as effective if a person realizes that it's being manipulated. So, th so this is one aspect. Um, so another aspect, so once we are able to create these messages, the uh, second aspect is to, um, is to uh, be able to spread uh, that information uh, over, um, over social media or by uh, exploiting, um, again, the general the, the internet. And for this could be useful to have bots that, uh, um, that also uh, the help uh, uh, sharing uh, the, uh, the content. And uh, obviously this should be done uh, with, with the goal like, of maximizing uh, uh, the audience as possible that can be reached. Uh, so another aspect that has, uh, um, uh, that has that plays uh, quite an important role here is the fact that um, the users uh, that social media like um, like Facebook are now are able to micro uh, profile to provide a, um, a very detailed profile of of their uh, of their users and this implies that before uh, when we when the, um, the traditional messages that were spread through um, all type of mass media like television or radio. So it was one message that should appeal to a lot of people, to a very uh, uh, large audience. But uh, now with the, um, if, you, if you put together the fact that we could be, we could be able to reach a lot of people in uh, a lot of people in, uh, in social media and to to know about um, to know their profile, so to know what the what topics they're most sensitive to, uh, we can create more effective uh, campaigns by sending to each person only the messages about the topics that is more sensitive to, and this of course would you know uh, make the uh, the campaign even more uh, even more effective than than before. So like and now in the forum, we'll talk mostly about the first, uh, the, the first uh, two aspects. Uh, so first, uh, we, we talk about uh, um, what are the approaches to the tech propaganda uh, document level. So we have a document and we want to see whether it's propaganda or it's, it's about is making propaganda or not, or um, if you uh, if you recall the definition, uh, trying to find all those techniques that are used to influence uh, uh, the person, so the, all the all the techniques that leverage to uh, on the emotions of the person, or they have like faulty uh, reasoning. <clears throat> so uh, if we uh, if we start about uh, like the text, let's start with the textual propaganda document level. In the uh, in that case. Uh, uh, from the technical point uh, of view, so if you want to deal uh, deal with it as a, like a machine learning problem, uh, we, we have that the first problem is that uh, the scarcity of uh, data, uh, of annotated data. So what has been uh, done to, uh, uh, to overcome uh, this issue is to, uh, is to use distance supervision. So, uh, on one side, yeah, there's, um, it might be even complex to annotate full documents, so very costly. But there are a lot of uh, 
uh, journalistic initiative in which there are um, entire media sources that are reviewed according to their bias, to whether they're propagandistic or not. There are some, uh, some of these initiatives, for example, Media Bias Fact Check, or um, there's a uh, disinformation web uh, database by the uh, European Union. So one thing that we can do, we can say uh, by using distance provisions, like all the articles that are that come from a media that are uh, that is propagand that is deemed to be propagandistic, uh, we consider all the articles as propagandistic, and all the article that comes from um, let's say more traditional uh, objective. Uh, uh, news uh, uh, news media, we consider them as non-propagandistic. Obviously, this is uh, uh, this is prone to to error because it is known that even propagandistic um, media sources they tend to publish from time to time very uh, very objective uh, articles, even just to boost their uh, their credibility. Uh, and on the other hand. Uh, even respectable sources might have, uh, on, maybe on very specific topic, topic they have uh, might have a strong bias or even uh, run some uh, campaign. <clears throat> so, as, as I was saying, so propaganda could be uh, is kind of related to two tasks. One is uh, bias detection. Actually, uh, some authors deem propaganda a form of extreme bias. And also the detection of uh, satire, fake news, or hyperpartisanship. There's been, uh, for example, Semival initiatives, um, competitions on detecting hyperpartisanship. So whether uh, a news is uh, biased in any of the two extremes, like left or right, if you're talking about, uh, for example, American politics. <clears throat> Um, so the first work that treated propaganda uh, detection as, as text uh, classification is one from uh, Rashkin uh, et al, in which they, they use distance supervision from a uh, giga work uh, corpus to annotate the uh, data into uh, a number of, um, of labels, among which propaganda was uh, one of these. Um, they had... Uh, Mm -hmm. They used word engrams and they had uh, um, quite uh, good results uh, if they were testing their systems on data coming from uh, media sources that have been used into the training set. If they were testing on, um, uh, on examples from new sources that were not being seen uh, during the training, then the performances would drop uh, significantly. So from 94, you can see here to around the 70. And this is one of a possible issue with uh, um, uh, when using distance supervision, because it might happen that actually um, the classifier try, uh, try to learn to model the media sources instead of the actual class that we're interested in, in this case, uh, propaganda or uh, the other classifications. Uh, a second word from uh, Baron Cedeno et al is uh, it's called Propy, and he uses uh, a large, uh, it has a, a larger number of uh, features going from lexical features, vocabulary richness, readability features, and style features, so uh, character uh, engrams. And uh, besides using again word uh, word engrams, so they have like a, uh, in this case a very uh, larger study. And in this case, uh, the results seems to uh, seems to confirm uh, the fact that uh, uh, there is a drop when the uh, when the um, when the classifier that could be very good on uh, in domain data is tested on on unseen uh, on unseen data. And in this, uh, they also create a, a larger um, they've created a larger um, corpus focusing on, on propaganda. It's, uh, it's called QPROP uh, 18, in which there are many more um, propagandistic sources and 
Um, in the previous one, there were only two sources. And um, the number of articles is uh, way larger. It's like 50,000. Uh, 50, Again, in, even in this case, uh, distance supervision has been, uh, has been used. And, uh, uh, and again, the results kind of uh, confirm uh, this trend. And uh, uh, so the authors then uh, checked um, from all the, the set of features, which one were mostly, uh, were more prone to uh, model um, the style of the media source instead of the actual uh, category. And, um, by uh, and the idea was to test them on uh, by giving them in training like um, the idea was to use on test uh, a number of sources there's five of them in this case and to uh, to change how many of these were seen uh, during training and as you can see that use word engrams that are more uh, powerful they tend to have a better performance uh, to change a lot of their performance when they don't see any um, source in the in the test set, uh, any source in uh, so the test set does not have any uh, example, any article coming from sources that has been seen in training, or they are very good when there are sources that ha uh, all the sources have been seen uh, in training. While, uh, uh, for example, Carter and Graham seems to be uh, more uh, robust. So, um, so one way could uh, to deal with um, with uh, with the problem of uh, distance supervision could be, for example, to use uh, adversarial uh, approaches. Um, there might be a way to uh, uh, to mitigate uh, the, the problem. Uh, but what, one issue is with uh, this, kind of, this kind of approach at the uh, document level is they tend to, uh, to lack uh, explainability. So it's not clear uh, why document is deemed uh, propagandistic or, uh, or not. And this, uh, like in practice, um, uh, it's, it could be quite, uh, quite a huge problem. Um, we were discussing uh, this with uh, some journalists that were interested in using some of these tools, and they were saying that we need to know how they do uh, how they they do uh, their choices, because otherwise, to to us, they are uh, a system that tells us if the document is propagandistic or not is kind of uh, not very useful. So uh, going into uh, also like way to go into this direction is to then to find uh, the techniques that are used. So going to a more fine grain level and finding the techniques that are used in a, in a document to influence uh, a person. It is kind of a, a novel uh, line of uh, line of uh, research. So besides being uh, like uh, interesting to um, by by itself, it also uh, could play an interesting finding the use of these techniques. So for example, I was saying like uh, in the example that I showed before, um, there was a, this attempt to appeal to the fear of the of the audience and so on. Uh, <clears throat> This, uh, this uh, the study of these techniques could also be useful in general for uh, tackling the problem of uh, disinformation because uh, people that might be aware of them, then they are less likely to be uh, manipulated. And we also uh, mentioned this. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, the first problem here is that uh, we want to, uh, to, to study the problem in from, from a computational point of view is that uh, there are um, even the set of techniques, there are different, um, different scholars have different uh, lists of, um, of techniques. There are just seven devices from the Propaganda um, uh, Analysis uh, Institute. And to, if you go uh, to Wikipedia, you can find around like 70 techniques. Yeah. 
but in uh, what happened is that in general these techniques can be um, so some of them I've just uh, some definition like I'm more general than others so they include other uh, other techniques maybe like one or more of these techniques and in what is common to uh, to uh, all the scholars is the fact that this the techniques can to can divide it uh, into two main categories. So there are some rhetorical techniques or mostly logical fallacies and psychological techniques. So the ones that leverage on the emotion of, uh, uh, of the audience. Uh, so for example, the le sorry, uh, leveraging on the uh, emotion of the audience could be appealed to the fear or to the prejudice uh, of the audience, the use of lower language, the use of uh, name calling, so calling names, uh, you're attacking your opponent by calling it uh, names instead of uh, refusing uh, its, uh, its argument. Or there are uh, other that are more, um, there are uh, logical uh, fallacies, uh, like the black and white uh, fallacies, when you only give to to possible uh, solution to a problem when there are actually many more, um, when, when there are actually more, and then you're forcing uh, your audience to choose between only one of these two. And of course, um, you're probably in the description, you're biased towards uh, one of them. Or uh, there are bandwagon when, uh, when you say that something is correct because a lot of people, because the majority of people, everybody thinks it's correct and it has to be uh, correct. So in this case, for example, let's see a couple of examples. This is uh, um, this is a, a cover page of the Daily News, old one, and it says that evil has landed. And in this case, this is an example of name calling. So he's calling the fir, uh, former prime minister of Iran evil. Uh, while this is a case of uh, it's an example of uh, logical fallacies of bandwagon. And when we say that um, uh, we should vote for Clinton as president because 50%, so the majority is voting uh, for her. But clearly this is not uh, uh, a good reasoning. Um, so getting back to the fact that uh, propaganda might not uh, have uh, he always a uh, hill in, uh, intent, uh, this is a speech from uh, extract from a speech from Greta Thunberg um, at the UN, uh, and at some point she says that we are in the middle of six mass uh, extinction with more than 200 species getting extinct every day. And here clearly she's appealing to the fear of the only. So this this is uh, uh, this is something big that is happening. So we have to do something. So uh, what are the, uh, the, uh, the corpora uh, available? Uh, so let's go quickly uh, through some of them. Um, so uh, first one is uh, um, there's a game called uh, Argotario that has been developed by Abernal uh, et al. And this is made uh, to educate people to uh, recognize uh, fallacies. And uh, uh, the game also asks to write them. And uh, so as a, as a byproduct uh, of this, uh, of this uh, educational game, uh, <clears throat> you get uh, the, the authors got uh, uh, a, a number of fallacies uh, created by the, by the users, more than uh, 1,000 of them. And um, these were about five uh, fallacies. Another... Uh, uh, another uh, corpus is uh, has been extracted by uh, is the change my view corpus. Um, in this case, change my view is um, is an online platform for um, on Reddit for uh, argumentation. So uh, in, in this case, like this, um, the users uh, post uh, an opinion, and uh, then the other users that they argument pro or against uh, this opinion. And this is a moderated platform, and specifically, the moderators uh, remove all, uh, all all the times that the person, instead of re uh, uh, refuting the actual argument, was attacking the um, the person, the the author of the, of the post. 
and uh, this is one of the, uh, for example, you know, using name calling, this is one of the examples that we have just seen. And uh, by doing so, uh, they got um, uh, they got a number of uh, threads uh, po uh, with number of posts with uh, a number of a domain uh, a dominion, uh, attacks or num uh, with fallacies, and then this has been uh, used uh, to create uh, to train a, a classifier. Uh, using uh, a CNN uh, and word to vec that was able to uh, reach an accuracy of uh, around uh, 81%. Uh, <clears throat> a larger uh, corpus is the propaganda te uh, techniques corpus uh, uh, that uh, in that case it consists of uh, more than uh, 500 uh, news articles from uh, 48 sources, uh, like in total 450k uh, tokens. And um, uh, the news articles are annotated at span level with uh, uh, one out of 18 techniques. So in this case, the corpus is uh, larger and is quite large and the number of techniques considered is also very uh, uh, larger than the, than the previous case in which will was one or at, uh, at most of five techniques. Uh, and also the type of annotation, uh, the are at span level, for example, these are, they could go from single words. So in this case, like babies, it's an example of uh, um, name calling to a black and white fallacies that goes from uh, almost uh, a from a full sentence um, and could be also annotation spanning um, a larger pieces, uh, piece of text or there could also be annotation overlapping with each other. So in this case, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a use of loader language together with exaggeration uh, looking as though Trump killed his grandma uh, and they are both uh, together in the same, uh, the kind of overlap together. And this has been published by uh, San Martin et al in EMLP in 2019. <clears throat> and these are some, uh, some statistics on the, uh, on the techniques itself. And we can see that the techniques that are more related to the emotions tend to be more present in, in, the, in the text while the, um, the Logical fallacies tend to be used uh, more, uh, less, way less frequently than, than the others. There's been four tasks that's been derived from the um, from the corpus, so uh, that has been used in, in, in a few competition later on. Um, the first one is called a fragment level classification, which is exactly um, corresponds to. Uh, doing what the annotators were doing. So finding the span in which a, a technique uh, uh, occurs and identifying the actual, uh, the actual techniques. Um, then, uh, so this, two, this task could be divided into two subtasks. The first one to find just the span in which the technique would appear. And the second one was so given a span find which technique was appearing in, uh, in, that, uh, in that span. Then uh, also the others have considered uh, a simpler uh, binary task in which for, um, for each sentence we're considering uh, a, binary classification, um, a binary label, whether in that sentence would appear any technique, at least one technique or none of them. Obviously this, this would be a slightly uh, easier uh, task. Um, the task itself would require to, uh, to define uh, appropriate evaluation measure because when we are measuring different spans together, there might be only a partial overlap. So there, there's been um, a doc evaluation measure that would account for a partial overlaps between uh, different techniques. Um, the same author then pro um, provides um, uh, experiment with four different uh, models, and finally uh, proposing a multi-granularity network. 
Um, in this case, the task was the complete one. So finding both the, the, uh, the span and the, uh, the technique, but they were also exploiting labels from the other task, in, in this case, from the binary task. So finding whether in the sentence there was any technique uh, or not. And uh, multi uh, the multi-granularity network it, it does this, uh, especially uh, this one. So it uses uh, a token level classifier. So each word is predictors whether being part of a, uh, of a technique or uh, none of them. Uh, but at the same time, he uses uh, use the CLS token of um, of BERT to uh, to classify the full sentence, and then uses that information as a gateway to um, to influence uh, the classification at token level. So the idea here is that if the sentence level classifier says that in that sentence there is no uh, things is very confident there is no technique, then it tries to influence. The classifier token level not to find any any technique in that uh, in that sentence, uh, and the results uh, were uh, quite uh, quite good. Was, we get an F one considering the partial overlap so uh, thirty eight. When we consider only the span, or uh, when we I try to identify the uh, the techniques as well of twenty two. Well, uh, on the other hand, when we um, when we uh, only consider the uh, the technique, uh, sorry, the um, the binary uh, classifier, the uh, performance are are better. In this case, we they are bumped to uh, sixty, almost sixty one percent. If you want to see a demo of uh, the system working real time and so. Uh, collecting news and identify the the technique in them. You can go to this uh, um, to this link, www.tambi.org/perta, and you can see it in action. Um, and actually, you can you can provide your own text to be analyzed uh, on the fly. So there's been quite a few um, uh, share uh, share tasks based uh, on the on the corpus, and um, in this case, uh, this was the um, the task was the binary uh, classifier, and um, was run at NLP for IF workshop and NLP for Internet Freedom in 2019, and the winner. Uh, got a, a complex system using like 12, uh, uh, to have uh, 12 head uh, attention transformer uh, models um, put together um, with different initialization in order to have like different sort of different views uh, on, the, uh, on the data. <clears throat> Uh, the same then uh, actually and the same uh, shared task it was also the full uh, the full task uh, and uh, in this case uh, the fact that um, uh, the data was uh, uh, was uh, a lot unbalanced there were some techniques that were less represented was um, exploited by oversampling some of the uh, some of the techniques uh, to get uh, uh, quite uh, quite a, quite an improvement on all, uh, the overall F1 uh, performance performance. In this case is micro uh, F1 performance. Uh, finally, there's been two tasks at Semival uh, 2020. Uh, in this case, um, the first task was the, was the span uh, identification. So, so only finding uh, the spans where a technique would occur independently of the technique. And even in this case, um, transformer model using um, the most successful one where um, uh, transformer model, but also by uh, LSTM, uh, Using uh, a bio uh, encoding of the data, so like token uh, at token level, um, so um, marking the tokens that were at the beginning of the span, inside of a span, or outside uh, of the uh, of the span. So this uh, this representation would uh, quite uh, be, uh, boost the performance. 
and um, the, um, the other task was at Semival was the classification task. So given a, sp a precise span to find what technique was uh, um, uh, was appearing in that in that span. And uh, Yurkevich uh, et al, they, they used a self-supervision uh, in which they were uh, 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 generating, uh, using a Roberta transformer system to train on the available data and then generating prediction on unseen data and use them again as a, a kind of goal data to refine uh, their classifier. So this idea was again, quite uh, successful. Uh, the work, uh, uh, so the, the use of preparing techniques is not only for text, they are also used uh, in, uh, in memes. And we actually, um, there was a, another semival task the year after. Um, again, this was in, the, uh, in, this time was in detecting the techniques in, in the memes, both in the text in, of the memes or uh, in the, um, uh, in the visual, uh, in the visual uh, components of the image itself uh, of the meme. Um, this was at Semival uh, test six, and there's a publication by uh, Dimitrov uh, uh, et al. that you can uh, check. So uh, just to conclude this part on, the, on propaganda, uh, so this is kind of a novel task, especially when we talk about the detection of the uh, of the techniques. Uh, this is quite an, uh, an important task, in my opinion, uh, and there are quite uh, encouraging results. But clearly, if you see the absolute uh, numbers, there's this, there's a lot of room for uh, improvement, and probably there's a uh, in order to that, there's required to, to have uh, more data, uh, more data annotated, but then these kind of annotation are quite complex, so they are quite, uh, unfortunately, they are quite uh, costly. And uh, uh, all the approaches we have seen so far that try to resolve, to find, uh, deal with all the techniques at the same time, but maybe there could be uh, specific approaches for or specific techniques. Uh, this concludes the uh, first uh, section of the tutorial. I would leave then the floor to uh, Firoz, unless there are questions. Thank you, Zivani. So we have a break at uh, 4.30, right? I mean, for me it's 4.30, but... Uh, for Giovanni, I think it's uh, five. I mean, in in uh, less than half an hour. Yes, maybe maybe we, we can start and we we see where we where we get. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Yes. Mm, give me a minute. Sir. Okay, it's, hello everyone. So uh, I'm Firoz Alam. I'll be talking about uh, identifying malicious actor. Uh, so uh, what uh, this malicious user or malicious actor uh, basically means and how they are reacting. So this malicious actor include like bots from Twitter and then um, vandals from Wikipedia, fake accounts uh, in Facebook, trolls and other uh, spammers are, that has been like uh, spreading fake news and uh, or misinformation. So there has been uh, many different efforts uh, towards the, to identify such uh, malicious user or actors. So um, uh, this is one of the work like detecting 
fake accounts and uh, this bottom eater toolkit has been uh, uh, widely used to identify this kind of um, uh, fake accounts or uh, Twitter accounts. So the task is, uh, the idea of this tool is that given a Twitter account, it extract like more than 1000 features relative to the account and then produce a classification as called, which is called like bot, uh, bot score. So based on that, like uh, one can identify whether the account is uh, controlled by bot or not. So uh, uh, basically it uh, reports a different, uh, six different service scores is produced by model based on this in subset of features like metadata, friends, content, sentient, network and timing. So only issue of this uh, tool is that uh, it lacks uh, reliable ground truth. And then uh, as you know that like many, uh, these bots or malicious users, they always adapt to new scenario or new conditions and it's difficult to uh, then um, identify them and it requires like adapting again adapting with uh, uh, new behavior and developing the mo uh, modular system and this is uh, another work uh, deep bot detection which is based on uh, user representation and uh, basically using uh, posting user representation or retweeting user representation and then combining those uh, information in a fused layer. And um, then this is another work and detecting coordinated behavior uh, retweet bust. So the idea is like identifying the retweet pattern. So uh, like detecting uh, coordinated behavior instead of like uh, fake account. So it encodes the uh, retweet pattern and discriminate between normal and inauthenticated behavior. The idea is like uh, we human do not then uh, exhibit more behavioral heterogeneity than uh, fake or uh, bot, bot type uh, accounts. So overall, the idea of uh, this uh, uh, malicious or user or malicious actor or this kind of account is that they always find new approach to temper the online uh, environment, like uh, such approach to, uh, uh, once those kind of approaches is identified or count, uh, they again uh, devise a new countermeasures. So this is kind of um, challenging for machine learning systems because once you design then uh, it, you need to design new model to de detect them and uh, to adapt like identify new type of behavior. And um, the coordinated uh, behavior is not necessarily harmful. So uh, uh, one uh, idea is that an analysis of the content of the message may show that, for example, that it may be a propaganda campaign. So uh, next we'll be talking about, I will be talking about the harmful memes. So as you have seen in, in previous uh, uh, talks, like a hot uh, Giovanni was presenting, there has been, uh, there are many different kinds of uh, content. Uh, some are harmful, some are uh, misleading. Uh, and among them, uh, a meme or multimedia um, content, multimodal content is one of them. So uh, in previous studies, there has been like work on identifying those kind of harmful or misleading information from textual content or, uh, or uh, imagery content or audio content. And all of them uh, basically work in isolation or independently. The meme actually combined both uh, textual and imagery part in, in, in integrated fashion because text are overlaid with, uh, on the image. So this is more challenging uh, in that respect. And recently there has been effort uh, to uh, identify this kind of har uh, content from uh, harmful content from me. And uh, as you can see a few example here on the left uh, one is uh, harmless. And this work is mainly actually uh, considered uh, uh, targeted to detect harmful uh, meme as well as the target either target it could be individual or organization or community or, or society. So uh, uh, what, uh, that, uh, what has been done in this work is that 
they collected data on different topics like uh, COVID vaccine, US election, uh, work from home, others, and then Wuhan virus and some uh, other topic from, and collected the meme from Google image, Instagram, and, and uh, other media. Uh, and the data has been annotated in different states, like uh, uh, it's for, uh, for on the harmful side, very harmful, partial harmful or harmless. And then uh, for the, as for target, it's targeting individual uh, organization, community or and society. So it has been done in several phase, first uh, uh, annotated, expert and annotated, and then in the consolidation phase, there has been um, the disagreement uh, cases uh, are resolved during the consolidation phase. So uh, with this annotation, this is a statistics for, uh, for both tasks, harmful and identifying the target uh, for harmfulness around 3,500 uh, 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 memes has been annotated. And for target identification, it was around uh, 1,200 plus. So uh, for the classification, uh, different approach has been uh, 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 addressed, like uh, uh, approaching considering only any models, text only, image only, and then image and text, then multi, using multimodal pre-training. And for classification, uh, uh, because the data is kind of skewed, so uh, uh, the authors have, have been trying uh, to classify them using um, two class classification problem and then and three class classification problem. In both cases, they show that uh, uh, multimodal free training uh, is outperforming, uh, outperforming all the other settings from majority to uh, any model and um, uh, combining um, image and text like lit fusion, concretization of BART and other models. So one thing uh, we can see that uh, like human performance is still higher in both cases uh, than uh, uh, machine learning model, which uh, actually shows that there is still uh, room for improvement for both uh, uh, classification tasks. So in terms of for uh, target identification of harmful mean, uh, here again, we see that there's a clear improvement uh, uh, for both modality using multimodal pre-training. Again, here we see the human performance in far more better than uh, machine learning models. So again, here we can clearly tell that uh, uh, there's a room for improvement uh, for this task. So from the same group of authors, uh, they uh, have another work, uh, which is the extension of previous work. They developed, a, uh, extended the data set with new topics, uh, which is US politics and considering uh, and the annotation and the uh, class level uh, are same, uh, like from harmfulness to target identification in same set of label and annotation has also been done using the same procedure. So for uh, this new uh, harming data set, the, the new set, uh, they have uh, a kind of uh, around, again, similar number of uh, uh, memes for both uh, harmfulness and target identification. Again, we can see that there is a clear skew distribution for different uh, labels, which actually makes the task more challenging, complex. So the momentum model they propose uh, combines uh, different things like uh, the extract uh, textual uh, text using OCR, and then from there, and they use a clip text encoder to extract the representation and then also extract uh, different attributes uh, like uh, entities and other information uh, from the means. And then uh, for uh, unimodal modality, like uh, for uh, image modality, they use uh, BGG19 models and then for text uh, distilled part. So combining all the model, they actually use cross model attention uh, framework uh, for detecting harmfulness and target. 
So uh, here, uh, what we see from the classification result is similar kind of uh, experimental setting, like unimodal to multimodal, uh, different combination like late fusion, uh, visual word, build word, and then uh, different um, combination of cliff, which is latest uh, state of the art um, for uh, both combining both uh, textual and image modality. So the proposed model basically, again, outperforming all other models uh, with a clear improvement. Uh, however, uh, we clearly see that here is still human performance is still better than uh, the proposed model. Uh, similar uh, for target identification, um, the proposed model is outperforming all other uh, unimodal and multimodal models. And again, same, uh, I, uh, we have same comment for uh, human performance that it's still higher than proposed model. So uh, uh, in terms of like uh, this uh, uh, harmful mean, uh, what we see that uh, uh, from this kind of work is that uh, multimodal is still outperforming any model model and the task is still challenging in different respect. And this is uh, interesting work because that uh, the meme actually, it, it meme is, uh, one can clearly identify type of uh, category of harmfulness and then the, the CBIT level of harmfulness and then who is uh, getting target. And, and, uh, and there's a room for improvement uh, yeah, in this domain and uh, we clearly invite uh, audience to contribute to this area. So next I'll be talking about uh, the COVID-19 infodemic uh, as is uh, like in, in previously, uh, Giovanni has mentioned that uh, this kind of means how this kind of uh, uh, misinformation or disinformation are affecting our society and our com community. So during uh, COVID infodemic, uh, um, all of us have been like relying on social media and uh, following what has been um, uh, happening around. And then uh, we not only actually consumed those information, but also consciously or, or unconsciously shared those kind of information. And, and what happened during this time is that the impact of misinformation needed to uh, death and uh, backseat hesitancy and uh, hesitancy and so so many other uh, impact. As you can see here, at least uh, 800 people uh, have died around the uh, world uh, because of coronavirus related misinformation. And due to that, like uh, World Health uh, Organization actually uh, for the first time uh, use the term uh, uh, infodemic because of the misinformation that fueling panic and racism. So uh, in order to uh, address such kind of things, uh, one thing I would like to note that, uh, uh, during, uh, so during that time, uh, uh, not only people shared uh, misinformation, disinformation, but also shared uh, some information that are helpful for the society or the community or the different stakeholder like you know, government agencies or Ministry of Public Health, for example. So uh, what we have observed is that not only uh, negative uh, or misleading information has been shared, but also positive information that helpful has also been shared. Considering all this information, uh, a multi-perspective annotation you know, has been developed in this work uh, along with L, uh, where uh, the perspective was whether such information can be useful to journalist, fact checker, social media platform, policy maker, or the society. So uh, here I'll show a few examples that clearly that will highlight what kind of uh, information we have been considering or like uh, this work has been considering. So here you can clearly see that this is a joke if the coronavirus enters, uh, coronavirus enters Spain, he will enter from the Barcelona defense side. And this is one example uh, of rumor um, that has not happened in, in, in this region, but um, this actually showing rumor. 
and then uh, conspiracy theories, uh, my body, my health, we don't need a pillar like Bill Gates telling us oh, what is healthy for us. So this kind of like 5G conspiracy ha has been uh, running around uh, and during the pandemic. So then I think most of you are familiar with uh, boiled garlic or fake cure uh, during the pandemic. And again, like many people actually adopted and uh, used this kind of uh, fake cure and got affected because of that. And then uh, we have also been observed this kind of things, Chinese food, Italian food, uh, one of the list of things I do not want to order or like uh, avoiding such kind of things that clearly shows the xenophobia, racism or prejudice. And then it's pretty uh, panic, uh, and the zombie apocalypse begins and Americans panic by by uh, guns because of that. So this kind of things has been uh, uh, going around the social media platform like Twitter. This is another example for blaming or accusing uh, authorities uh, that driving its speed on COVID-19 test uh, pandemic manipulated measurement. So then as, again, uh, this is one of the positive example uh, for advice and recommendation. Um, again, this kind of information might be useful for Ministry of Public Health or different other stakeholders. Uh, uh, then and this is another example for discussing action taken, uh, uh, like uh, uh, gradual return to COVID normality and then you know, test for a week that can, um, uh, that are action, that action has been taken in uh, different places. And then call for action. Uh, I think the government should uh, close all the barber shops and salon. And um, this is one of the advice that uh, can be, and that actually uh, asking for action to be taken into account. And this is another example for discusses possible cure. Uh, another example is, uh, is the virus going to totally disappear this summer, like asking for a question um, that, um, let's say, different public health may answer for and then help the society. So considering all this aspect uh, and uh, this work actually developed the annotation schema and developed a data set uh, for four different languages. Uh, during that time, we later extended for other languages too. So in this data set, it, it contains around 16,000 annotation considering in all this aspect and uh, developed annotation schema targeting seven different questions like, uh, does the tweet contain a verifiable factual claim? And then to what extent does the tweet appear to contain false information? And then whether the tweet claims have an impact on or be interested, uh, be of interest to the general public, and then whether uh, to what extent that tweet appear to be harmful to the society, person, company, or product. Uh, do you think that professional fact checker uh, should verify the claim in a tweet? And then this is important for uh, professional fact checker that uh, tweet is check or or not. And then it is, is the tweet harmful to the society and why? And do you think mm, that this tweet should get uh, the attention of a government entity? So these uh, seven questions actually are important for different uh, stakeholders, uh, like uh, fact checker, journalists, uh, public health professionals. So using these data, so once data set has been ready, then uh, uh, classification model has been developed considering different uh, aspect like uh, here the result cons uh, consider Twitter context, propaganda and bottometer features. And we see that uh, uh, there are different uh, combination of results for different models and uh, uh, for binary and multi-class settings, multi-class for fine grain settings. And then Overall uh, performance is observed for BART and bottom and features for both binary and multi-class settings for different uh, questions. And for we, uh, another uh, thing we, we clearly see here is that uh, the result for multi-class uh, settings uh, comparably lower, comparatively lower than 
and binary settings, which is obvious because of the complexity of the task uh, increases when uh, number of level increase from two to um, more levels. And it also uh, resulted from the skewed distribution of that data set. And another uh, experiment has been conducted considering uh, multitask learning and because uh, the task, uh, some of the tasks are quite uh, closely related. Uh, for example, task two to uh, five, uh, question two to five. And uh, so here, a different model has been uh, uh, explored, uh, Bart uh, and Robert uh, for single task to multitask. Again, here we see that for, um, different question multitask learning setup course uh, better than single task learning setup. So once uh, the model has been developed and uh, uh, there has been uh, work to develop uh, the API to facilitate and the different uh, the users that uh, which can be useful to develop application or can be indicated into existing application. So this is now publicly available. Uh, anyone can go and try uh, the uh, API, and which actually takes uh, a, a text as input and, and task and then language. So because uh, we have done two uh, binary and multitask, uh, multi-class task, and then uh, four different languages. And uh, using that, uh, one can easily try and integrate into the uh, existing application or new application. And the API is uh, completely free and so it's easy to integrate. So uh, again, uh, the uh, work has been extended to also develop a demo. Uh, here you can find the link to the demo uh, the, on the left side, um, which is basically text, input text as input, and then yeah, one can get give the input text as input and then just try to classify that with, and which uh, gives the summary of the overall classification result, then also gives the individual classification result. On the right side, you can see the uh, analytics uh, platform where you can actually uh, search for a topic and then uh, select a date from a start and end date. And then you can see overall uh, analytics over the time period, whether the, uh, the effect is increasing or decreasing over the time. And for any tef, you know, any topic like you know, for and uh, again for different questions. So, uh, sorry, uh, Firosh, uh, yeah. maybe it's, it's a good time to take a break now. What do you think? Yeah, because yeah, sure. Uh, we... Exactly the time now, and uh, uh, maybe this is a bit different uh, data set. So maybe it's it's a good time. It, if there are any questions, we are here, of course. Um, otherwise, we'll start back in 15 minutes. Okay, so uh, let us talk about more on COVID related infodemic. So, uh, before I was uh, discussing the multi perspective annotation schema uh, developed and the results based on that. And uh, there has been another work by uh, Zafarini uh, uh, Joao et al. Uh, uh, they actually developed a data set called Recovery based on distance supervision uh, approach. What they did yet, uh, is that they first identified the reliable and unreliable news from different sources. And then uh, uh, based on that, they collected um, and, uh, uh, data and uh, considering that a news site is uh, reliable if uh, uh, this new news guard score is uh, greater than 95 percent uh, 90 uh, so basically how the way news guard actually um, uh, annotate data based on different question and they have different rating points uh, on that and if uh, so a news site is reliable when the, this score is greater than 90 and then it's factual based reporting on the uh, very high or High based on media fact check. So it is uh, unreliable uh, if it is in a score is less than 30 and in factual reporting on uh, media bias fact check is below mixed. So based on this in, uh, news garden media bias fact check, the, 
they developed in this uh, data set. And using their uh, data set, uh, uh, they actually uh, also collected emails and other social media information. Uh, uh, then uh, which resulted in this uh, large data set, uh, like more than 140,000 tweets and around 2,000 news article uh, combining with image and social media information. So their proposed model actually consider all this kind of uh, information to, to develop the model. And uh, in, for COVID related uh, in this information, this is another work, uh, this is COVID-19 claim categorizer. Uh, uh, again, this uh, work actually collected data from uh, which uh, uh, include and from 19 different countries and 14 different languages. And sources include social media platform, TV, newspaper, radio, and different messaging application. The, they actually developed a uh, annotated schema which consists of 10 different uh, categories and data has been manually annotated. So, so they initially started data uh, collecting data from IFC and web pages. And here is the structure of the data set which consists of like uh, debunk, uh, date, uh, claim, explanation, source link, veracity level, uh, organ uh, originating platform, source page language, media types, and uh, categories which are manually annotated, as you can see here. Uh, so uh, from the, these are uh, categories that uh, I was talking about, 10 different categories. And then if you see the statistics of the data set, this is clearly very skewed. And the reason for such kind of skewness is that the annotating and collecting this kind of data set is uh, really complex and expensive. And this is actually affecting the whole annotation process and the resulting level data set. So there, uh, with that data set, they also proposed a, a neural uh, uh, topic model, which actually be, uh, based on variation autoencoder containing six sub modules uh, stacked on one uh, or another, one with another. And uh, the resulting, uh, uh, experimental setting, they tried uh, BART, uh, different BART model, and then with their proposed uh, model, they show that performance improves uh, uh, for different uh, levels. Uh, I'll, uh, for uh, some levels, actually simple BART model is performing better than uh, their proposed uh, uh, classification or neural tropic models. Once they developed the model, they also actually developed the API and demo for the user to use. And uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure currently their web service is currently working. Uh, uh, one can try and see. Uh, this is another data set, COVID lies, which uh, again, uh, and uh, uh, contain manual attention with more than 6,000 and annotated a tweet, which are based on 86 different pieces of COVID related misinformation. So they devised two different tasks. And the idea is uh, for the first task is that given a tweet, whether any of the known misconceptions are expressed in the tweet. And for the second task, uh, the idea is if the tweet is the missing the misconception, basically they agree then uh, 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 misconception, combat the spread of misconception or takes no stance towards the uh, misconception. So basically these two tasks uh, here, you can see the example that in the, for the first tweet, coronavirus uh, uh, COVID-19 was the top, uh, was a top secret biological per experiment. That is why it is only affecting the poor. Clearly this is a, a misconception and and the original misconception is coronavirus is genetically engineered. So this actually aligned and both of them agree. The another example is it looks like we are all going to have to wait much longer for COVID-19 for a COVID-19 vaccine. And the original misconception was we are very close to a vaccine. So this is clearly disagree with the tweet. Uh, 
the third example here you can see the CDC coronavirus spread rapidly in dense population with public transit and regular social gatherings. The misconception is coronavirus cannot live in warm and topical temperature. Uh, there is no stance between misconception and breed. So uh, here, uh, as I mentioned, the data set is, contains 86 misconception and around 6,000 annotated to misconception pair. And again, here um, aligned with previous data set I was talking about, here uh, we also see there's a clear uh, skewed distribution, which actually affecting the uh, training the model and affecting also affecting the classification performance too. So along with the proposed data set, they also uh, developed a model uh, for uh, misconception retrieval and stance detection. And they tried different uh, combination uh, like TF-IDF with cosine similarity, VM25, and globe, BART embedding, BART score, and then um, with a domain adaptation, uh, cosine similarity with the average BART embedding model and BART score. So uh, for misconception retrieval, um, they found um, BART score is performing better than all other experimental setting they have tried for both uh, AG and relevant misconception retrieval task. And for the stance detection, they have tried many other different combinations, again, from simple uh, bag of word model to uh, Biolistian sentence part, part score, and then different domain adaptation and combination of uh, other uh, different settings. Again, here uh, for all um, settings, if we consider uh, macro average, then we see that BART score with sentence BART uh, is performing better than other model. So again, from the result for different um, levels, we see that uh, for uh, uh, the performance is lower for disagree stance than other settings uh, in different experimental um, approaches. Next, I'll be talking about the COVID-19 rumor data set. So it consists of manually labeled around uh, 7,000 data, around 4,000 rumor from news and then around 3,000 rumor from tweets with sentiment and stance level. So the veracity stances of the rumor, rumor uh, is collected from facts, different fact checking websites. Like, uh, then also include uh, around 32,000 reposts from news rumor and around 34,000 retweets from tweet rumor and uh, manual stance level, uh, manually level in the stance. So the way they actually collected data, they uh, collected different uh, rumor misconception uh, and they collected different, they use different keywords to collect a uh, rumor misconception from fake news websites and then um, they filter and get them from Twitter and, and Google Crawler and then manually label them. Uh, then uh, also uh, manually label for veracity and sentiment level, stance level. Here is an example of um, data structure um, that you can find in their data set. So this is uh, basically their uh, data labeling part plan. Now once they collected the rumor, then they uh, 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 get the veracity uh, uh, level from the website, true or false, and then uh, evaluate them with uh, common knowledge. And then also um, at the same time, they also collect uh, tweets uh, uh, associated with uh, those uh, rumor and then uh, label them with uh, label, uh, and manually label sentiment, uh, positive, negative, uh, or neutral, and then also uh, uh, label instance uh, either support or disagree. At the same time, uh, with their data set, they also propose a, a, a model 
which actually combines uh, uh, different uh, settings, uh, combining uh, transform models uh, for veracity, uh, strength, and sentiment. So um, for the veracity classification, they have a, a performance around 85, 86, and then for instance classification around 70, and then for sentiment classification around 77. Another uh, data set is uh, uh, COVID fake news data set. This is mainly uh, for social media post and news article, only two uh, level, uh, the real and fake news for COVID-19 consisting of around 10,000 social media posts. Uh, here you can see the statistics of that data set considering and other tasks the, and this has like quite close, not very close distribution than other. Uh, uh, then uh, balanced distribution, I would say. Um, however, the uh, this the distribution here is better than other data set I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, here they tried very simple approach like DCNT, logistic realization, SDM, and uh, higher uh, and then GTVT, gradient JSON boosting tree, and. Um, here they found better result with uh, SGM. So to summarize uh, the work related to COVID related uh, disinformation, and there has been several uh, resources uh, uh, developed concerning multiple aspect of COVID related disinformation that are useful for let's say different stakeholder, uh, policymaker, um, journalist, fact checker. And uh, overall what we observe or to see is that and data set are uh, imbalanced and this good class distribution and uh, which actually makes the task more challenging and complex. So what uh, could be done in uh, using to address this task is that uh, maybe some data augmentation technique or uh, uh, reducing data imbalance problem can be approached to tackle the problem, uh, this kind of uh, task. And the most common approaches we have uh, seen are transformer-based model and in several tasks, uh, uh, ensemble and combination of diverse research set has, uh, has also been uh, approached uh, in different studies. So I will stop uh, here and then uh, I'll ask uh, Freslab to take the floor and uh, continue on the talk. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Do you guys hear me? Yeah. You should. Okay, sounds good. Let me uh, share a screen. Maybe I can, yeah, okay, let me share the screen. Okay. I should see my screen. Do you see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. So um, let me kind of now jump to fact checking, right? This is what people normally do when they think of these kinds of problems. And um, so I believe that Giovanni already told you about this uh, uh, distinction between misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. So disinformation is the something that is both false and it intends to do harm. And misinformation is something that is just false, regardless of whether this is on purpose or not. So disinformation is a special kind of misinformation and also a special kind of malinformation. So it's the intersection of the two. Um, but <clears throat> so the vast majority of the work uh, on the problem, of course, has been looking into whether something is true or not. Um, and again, just to stress, it's only half of the problem. The other half is, is, is this on purpose and is there malicious intent, right? And, and, and so, but let's look into factuality, right? Uh, there have been so many fact-checking uh, efforts, and this is great. So, and uh, maybe maybe the biggest ones, the three biggest ones are the factcheck.org, Quality Fact, and Snoops. And they have been like others, like Full Fact is the leading one in UK. Uh, Otaviano is the leading one in the you know, Arab world, or, or neutral in Spain, and so on. And they have been like different uh, European level projects, like FIM and Reverify. Uh, that he been looking into uh, fact checking. Okay, and then um, 
there, the Duke Reporter Swap does two interesting things. Um, it certifies the, the um, um, fact checking organizations uh, for their quality and standards, and also, of course, uh, has a database of those. And uh, um, if you go there, you're going to see that there are about 300 active uh, fact checking efforts and about 100 inactive. And you might think that that's actually quite a lot, which it is. But then if you start thinking how many, uh, how much has been uh, fact checked, then, then the, the image is not so rosy. So um, let me see if I can put the headphones for better sound. Okay, so let me see. Um, not sure, let me kind of stop sharing just for a second to adjust this. Okay, I think it has adjusted, right? You guys still hear me very well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I think I think it has uh, automatically. Okay, so if you look into how much has been fact checked, right? Um, um, this is from from uh, claims KG. I'm going to mention it later. It's a data set where they have been like parsing claims into a knowledge graph. But let, let's forget about the knowledge graph now, and let's kind of think about the claims, right? <clears throat> And you see that uh, Snoops has 13,000 claims, PolitiFact 16,000. Those numbers are a little bit higher now. For PolitiFact, there is about 21,000. Uh, those, this, this is about two years old, but kind of it gives you the big picture, right? So several sources just have a few hundred claims. So even though, <clears throat> some have even less. So if, even though you might think, oh, it's like 300 different fact-checking organizations, what they have collectively fact-checked is not that much, right? So, so it's, it's probably like a few hundred thousand. Um, and uh, so what, what can we do? And, and again, kind of the vast majority of the, of the tools have been like looking into, okay, let's do something that is doing do fact checking automatically. But you might also think of, can we actually develop tools that are going to make the fact checkers uh, more productive? And you can make parallel to, you know, to machine translation technology. So there's something that is doing fully automatic translation, but it's also kind of translation memories, which are, uh, uh, tools that are helping uh, the human translator. So if you think of a human machine cooperation uh, framework, then what kind of technology do the fact checkers need? And uh, we have been running the cleft check that lab for several years now. And uh, back in 2020, we had a round table where we have invited representatives of different fact checking organizations. And they have been discussing what fact checkers want. And here I have borrowed a slide from uh, um, uh, David Corney from Full Fact, <clears throat> where uh, uh, he actually listed the desiderata for fact checkers, right? And if you see the number one is, I want to know what is interesting to fact check in the first place. There are so many claims made in the world, right? I cannot fact check everything. The second thing is, I want to know where it was fact checked before by me, by my organization, or even by other fact-checking organizations that I, that I trust, because the same claims are repeated over and over again. And the last uh, list in, I think in the wish list is, uh, um, you want some evidence that is going to be, to help you to do the fact-checking. And, and uh, uh, maybe you want the full scale automatic fact-checking, but really uh, in the context of cooperation, they, humans don't really, fact checkers don't really want to be replaced. They want to be made more efficient, right? And again, the vast majority of the work has been looking into this, okay? And those tasks has been neglected. The, whether something is worth fact checking or, or whether was, something was fact checked before. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, we had last year, uh, um, uh, we had um, a survey at HKE uh, on, um, automatic on technology to assist uh, uh, human fact checkers. Um, and uh, if you think about it, you can, you, can think, you can think of the four main steps. This kind of aligns quite well with the four main steps of, of fact checking uh, in an abstract way. So you have some claim, right? I mean, that might come from political debate, from the news, from social media, uh, doesn't matter, right? And, and, and then you want to understand what it's interesting to fact check in the first place, right? It can be a trivial claim like uh, France is the capital, uh, sorry, Paris is the capital of France. I mean, that's not interesting to fact check, right? Or Lyon is in France or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so you want to, to find 
kind of to spot the interesting claims that are worth the fact checker's time. Um, and then the second step is, okay, was it fact checked before? Okay, if it was, then then maybe kind of you don't need to spend time on that. And then then kind of you want to get evidence and finally verify the claim. And again, as I said, human fact checkers want assistance maybe in the first three steps. Um, uh, but kind of while most of the systems can be really focusing on the on the on the last step, right? Uh, but actually, if you want to have a fully automatic system that scans the scans the, the media and tries to find false claims, maybe you want to find interesting claims, then check whether they were fact checked before, then try to find evidence to fact check them, and 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 finally, right? I mean, the 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 to see whether this was fact checked before. Okay, what is worth fact checking? Um, um, and and this was kind of neglected problem. But we are proud that we have been promoting it uh, as part of the Check That Lab. But uh, um, so the, this really started in political debates, and and here's here's the task, right? So imagine there is a long debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, in the presidential elections, and they uh, say many many claims, and uh, fact checkers are actually fact check some of them, right? So uh, they say, okay, you know, I don't know. We are uh, winning the battle on coronavirus. I mean, this kind of this basically what this says uh, in a little bit different words. Um, and uh, uh, so, and the fact checkers are writing an article about this claim and so on and so forth. And this is taken from the presidential debate. Now, if you look into the transcript of the presidential debate, right, they're they're on average 1,300, 1,400 sentences, and each sentence can contain well, maybe zero, maybe one, maybe more claims. <clears throat> and if you're a fact-checking journalist, you want to know, you want to decide what is most interesting to fact-checking because really, maybe you can fact-check five claims or 10 claims, no more than that. And um, so, yeah, you might want uh, uh, quickly to be told what are the interesting claims. And uh, um, so the claim buster is one system like that, where you can give it any text, this pioneering work from 2015, uh, you give it any text and uh, it's going to give you a score for um, each um, a sentence, uh, how interesting it is for fact checking, okay? Um, and uh, <clears throat> the way that they annotated the training data, they have been looking into every single sentence and they have been asking uh, students, but also journalists and all different people to, to say uh, um, whether this sentence is con contains in the first place factual claim or not, okay? So if it doesn't contain a factual claim, then it's not interesting. And then, and then if it contains a factual claim, you want to say whether this is an important factual claim or not important factual claim. And only those that contain important factual claims are actually those that are worth fact checking, okay? And, and um, um, this is how data was, the, their data was kind of annotated. Um, an alternative way to look into this problem is to say, okay, you know what? Here, here's a transcript. And uh, maybe we can look, instead of trying to hire people to tell us which sentence it is for fact checking, maybe we can actually ask um, ourselves, okay, what were the sentences that human fact checkers actually decided to fact check in this debate? Maybe those are the interesting claims, right? Because they have to make a selection somehow. And maybe you can learn from this. Maybe you can train systems to which if we give a document like that, they are going to select those sentences. And um, actually there is data like this. So um, PolitiFact has um, uh, certain debates annotated in this way. They um, have the full text of the debate and they highlight certain part and then they say, you know what? I mean, uh, this is mostly false and there's a link and, and, and you know, and uh, <clears throat> so basically kind of they're telling you which, which parts are true and which are false. And um, of course they comment only on part of it. So for example, here you see the 650 million to all street and foreign banks. I mean, this claim was not considered so important, so interesting, it was not really selected, right? But this one was, that Donald Trump didn't pay any federal taxes, okay? And uh, federal income taxes. And, and um, um, so <clears throat> now here we are not really interested in whether this claim is true or not. We're interested in the fact that uh, human fact checkers, sorry, I actually have to take that. 
you see this this was also selected as 650 billion uh, it actually has a pale uh, green it was also an interesting claim <clears throat> um so um but let's say that makes me smart doesn't mean that you know this this was not something that that is uh you know that is uh, uh, uh worthy. <clears throat> And uh, from here, you can just say, you know what? Uh, uh, fact checkers decided that this sentence and this sentence contain checkworthy claims. So uh, those are positive examples. Everything else is maybe negative. Um, and uh, yeah, National Public Radio has the same thing and, and others. So basically you can collect data like that, right? Uh, that, that tells you which claims were actually fact checked by human fact checkers. And um, so you can go and, and uh, so for example, if you look into the, this is kind of old data, but this was done recently for, for more uh, recent debates and speeches. But um, if you look into presidential debates from 2016, um, you can go and you can collect uh, uh, judgments about kind of, you can check which claims were fact-checked in the first, second, third presidential debates, in the best presidential debates, and, and in different factual organizations. Um, and uh, so collectively, those four debates have 5,400 sentences. Um, and interestingly, only one of them was selected by all nine sources, right? Um, and uh, six sentences were factored by eight different sources, five by seven different sources, and so on. And here are cumulative scores, for example, 12 sentences were selected by uh, seven or more sources, seven, eight, or nine. Uh, and uh, yeah, you see that, that uh, you know, you have uh, many sentences, 492 were selected by exactly one source. So this, this is a lot of subjectivity in the task, but you see that also there's this certain kind of overlap, right? And, uh, and, and then of course you can kind of, create a system that does different kinds of things. It looks into the language and land and the position and the named entities uh, and the topics discussed and, and, and other things and whether this claim is similar to previously fact-checked claims and all kinds of things, right? I don't want to go into detail here, but you can actually do multitask learning. You can try to predict whether each of those uh, sources would uh, uh, um, um, select this uh, claim for fact checking and and you can also uh, 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 predict whether any any of those would, would take it and uh, actually doing multitask learning uh, helps compared to trying to imitate one specific source and they have no like system similar to the claim buster like the claim rank system which uh, uh, where you can put certain uh, document and it also kind of tells you what are the most interesting claims to fact check and it works in English and in Arabic, and you can say, I want to imitate PolitiFact or, 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 or somebody else. Um, and we had a, a clef check that, uh, that was running from 2018 until today. And uh, this task has always been there, right? Uh, for check worthiness. And, and um, so um, there are um, 50, a total of 57 different debates and speeches. Um, uh, where 800 claims are checkworthy, and uh, um, you know, 50,000 are not checkworthy, and and uh, um, yeah, this is this is a collection that was used uh, in, in in these competitions, and it's kind of growing because each year there is a new test set, and you know, the old train their test is kind of added to training. Um, okay. So you can also have look into the task of uh, check worthiness, not only in terms of debates, but also in TV shows, right? And, and uh, so um, people say many things. Um, and this is a uh, research, this, this is kind of an effort done by FUFAC, which is an actual fact-checking organization, because uh, why are they doing this? Well, um, as I said, fact-checking a claim can take a lot of time, maybe a day or two, uh, sometimes a week, and you don't really want to, uh, to fact check it before. This is one motivation that they have mentioned. But actually, fact checking organizations like FUFAC, they have also a, another motivation. And the motivation is this okay, we have fact checked this claim. It took us so much. But then politicians keep repeating it. Okay. Well, if they keep repeating it, then you want to be able to, you know, to. Uh, mm, mm, 
Okay, sorry, I'm not talking about the different task. So, so here we're kind of interested. Uh, uh, um, uh, the 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 kind of okay. He, he, here we are interested in in which are the most interesting claims to fact check, right? Kind of you know they are scanning TV shows, um, and and newspapers and so on. And uh, they have their own annotation schema, which was published uh, uh, last year. Um, and uh, you can actually go and check the claim. I mean, uh, yeah, this is an alternative effort, right? To define what is worth fact checking. Uh, um, and and uh, finally, we can kind of discuss what is worth fact checking in uh, tweets. Okay, so, um, and again, you can, you can ask fact checkers to tell you or, uh, um, but, but kind of let, let me tell you the problem, right? Uh, and why this is important. Well, many factual organizations are monitoring the, the social media accounts of celebrities. So for example, here we have Eric Trump and he's posting all kinds of things. Thanks William Post, William Sport, Pennsylvania. I mean, there's, there's nothing uh, interesting here to fact check. And, you know, another is kind of from, from some campaign and, and, you know, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But one day he tweets this, okay? Oh. The media are not going to report this, but he's a copy of the check that Donald Trump is donating his salary to the US government. And this quarter, he donated actually to fight the coronavirus. So, um, and, and they see, you know, a check for $100,000. Well, um, the claim is that Donald Trump is donating his salary to fight the coronavirus. Okay. Uh, and I guess you'd agree this is an interesting claim to fact check. Um, and uh, yeah, it is check worthy. And by the way, if you wonder, uh, the, the, this is true. Uh, but kind of here, the task is just like whether this is check worthy or not. And uh, how do we know whether something is check worthy? Well, um, you can think about it, but maybe maybe claims that are viral or have the potential to be viral, right? That are popular are interesting potentially, right? I mean, this kind of maybe one one important aspect characteristic. Another one is, well, maybe they should contain verifiable factual claim. Uh, uh, maybe should they should, uh, I mean, on the first place, because if they don't, there's nothing to fact check. So this is super important, this problem number one, right? And then maybe they should be likely to be false. They should be of general interest and they should be potentially harmful. And, and after you answer these questions, then you need to make a judgment whether this is worth fact checking, worth the time of a uh, 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 um, you know, professional fact checker. And again, uh, this was a task that, that uh, uh, um, you know, in collection of tweets, this is a collection from 2021, and there's now another one from 2020 where another language is added, uh, basically Dutch. But uh, you see, it's like a few thousand claims, uh, tweets in Arabic, Bulgarian, English, Spanish, Turkish, and, and, and now also in Dutch. Um, and they are covering different topics like COVID-19 and politics. Um, and uh, okay, another task, the next, the next task that we have been like, talking in the, in the fact checking uh, pipeline is uh, detecting uh, previously fact check claims, right? So imagine, I mean, some, some applications of that. Well, um, um, we have already talked that the fact checkers might want to know where this was fact checked before, or if you are building a system, it's a shortcut, right? You see this claim, ah, something super similar was fact checked, you want to kind of to, make sure that it's really the same claim. And then you say, okay, you know, now I know it's, it's true or not. Um, and <clears throat> another thing is, imagine during a political debate, right? The person asking the question, if you can, politicians keep repeating the same thing. So you can like just bring and say, oh, he just said something that you know is false. And, and you can actually follow up with a question immediately and put them on the spot. Um, and uh, it's the same during a, a, an interview, right? I mean, you can, and, and, and you cannot do this really with uh, just with a fully automatic system because you cannot say, Mr. President, I have a, here an AI tool that tells me that you are now 97% likely to be lying, right? Uh, I mean, this doesn't mean anything, but if actually the system tells you, look, uh, he just said something that uh, was fact-checked by, I don't know, let's say by PolitiFact, and they have found it false. So, um, you know, this kind of another example of collaboration between the human and the AI uh, where um, uh, you are using all this uh, uh, hard work uh, and effort done by human fact checkers, uh, whose work is arguably uh, check work, kind, kind of trustworthy, um, and, and uh, you are putting it uh, together with a tool 
to deliver to the journalist an information that uh, that person might trust much more than, than if you just say uh, this 97% likelihood that the person is white. Um, and uh, yeah, and as I said, politicians keep repeating the same claims. I mean, they're, they're, and, and, and they, they, there's a reason for that. I mean, one is human rage, nature, but the other thing is that by repeating, they are appealing to a psychological bias of, of, of uh, familiarity. So, um, um, you know, if you keep hearing the same thing, at some point you start believing it. Actually, something, something funny is that even if I keep telling you it's not true that X, it's not true that X, and I keep repeating this, um, at some point you start believing that it's not true, but you also kind of start believing a little bit that it's true because uh, it's just a familiarity. You have I mean, and, and whether you have heard the, the claim or the negation of the claim, I mean, both of them now kind of sound familiar and, and you start kind of believing a little bit uh, each of them to a different extent, right? So um, that's why if you know something is false, it's better not to, you know, tweet it, not to spread it further, even just saying it's not through the text because you're kind of invoking this... Uh, they're actually helping the spread of the, the false claim. But kind of politicians do this on purpose, you know, so that you hear a certain claim again and again and again, it's at some point that if you start believing it uh, because it sounds familiar. Um, and, uh, you know, here the task is, okay, you have a database of, of previously fact-checked claims and the new claim comes um, and, and uh, you know, new claim comes and, and, and they need to say whether this was previously fact-checked fact or not. And maybe, one way is I might um, want to uh, model this as a ranking task. So given my input claim, I want to produce a rank list of the database of previously fact-checked claims um, so that those that are more similar uh, or more helpful for me to verify the original claim uh, are ranked as high as possible. And um, th that's not a trivial task. Um, I mean, in certain cases, the input claim is exactly the same as what you have in the database. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit different. So for example, in one debate, uh, Donald Trump said he really wants to give amnesty. And uh, the human fact checkers have selected this claim and have said, oh, we have fact checked this before. And, and he's the claim they have fact checked before. That Hillary Clinton says, or that, that, that somebody says, maybe Donald Trump, that uh, Hillary Clinton wants to have open borders. And see, he's like, give amnesty, supposedly to illegal immigrants, and he have open borders. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can argue that this is about this, but uh, it's not the exact same, same, same text, right? I mean, but those are considered a good match. And, 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 and there are some others, and those are kind of even harder, right, to make. So what I'm saying is, it's not really a trivial task, right? But, but to human fact checkers, if you have this original claim and you give them this claim, or you have this original claim, give them this claim, and of course with the associated article, then uh, they can actually tell you whether this is true or not, right? Based on this article. So um, yeah, it's important to be able to retrieve this. Um, and and uh, I'll skip this. So there, there, there's a collection about that of, uh, um, you know, um, input and verified claim pairs. There are like 700 of those from PolitiFact, 1,000 from Snoops, and then those are to be matched against 16,000 or 10,000, you know, from PolitiFact and Snoops. And those are kind of two different tasks because here the claim is a tweet and you have to match it to um, a collection of 10,000 uh, um, uh, verified claims with an associated article. And here the claim is... Uh, uh, you know, some statement in, in a political debate or speech, and you want to match it against, uh, again, a collection of uh, 16,000 article kind of claims, but fact-checked from, from um, um, political act. And it turns out that for this task, right, you, you can actually have certain kind of uh, semantic similarity matching based on sentence birth or, you know, kind of fine-tuned transformer and so on and so forth, like Bert or Roberta. Um, it turns out that for this task, you really need first an information retrieval step, uh, something like BM25, uh, uh, let's say Elasticsearch or Solar or something like that, right, to do the matching for you. Um, and after that, you can actually do a re-ranking. Um, 
and and uh, yeah, here are some results. But I mean, if you just try to match based on 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 BERT, you don't go that far. Uh, even if you kind of match not in one sentence but multiple sentences, and uh, if you do actually matching, uh, it's uh, better. It actually works much better. And and, and another thing that is interesting is. Um, because as you have seen here, some of the claims are quite different. It's actually, you don't, you should not really match just against this verified claim, uh, but you should be matching against the entire article because the human fact checkers are writing an entire article justifying why this is true or not, right? Why is this? Well, I mean, here there are probably other keywords that you can actually match inside the article. Uh, so it's just kind of additional information. Um, so really the recipe for solving this task, I mean, kind of the one of the, one, one popular recipe that, that um, people have been using, for example, in the class share task um, is um, you <coughs> first do information retrieval based on the entire document. Um, and uh, uh, then you do certain kind of re-ranking of the results where you, uh, you know, construct a vector of, additional features so some are the scores from the information retrieval and some are the the scores from certain kind of semantic similarity matching uh, with some transformers and you combine those and you rerun the results um, and yeah so this from quality five this one's notes you see that kind of the ranking you see a lot and, but in any case information retrieval is better than you know matching um, and uh, they have like uh, variants of this task. And one variant is uh, uh, verifying uh, claims about images. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so um, you, um, you have a tweet that contains a claim um, and, and, and you kind of try to, to, to detect whether this, was, this tweet or this claim was previously fact-checked. And basically the way that this is done is uh, you are separately matching the text uh, um, you know, and, and, and you're also kind of separately matching the images, something like that, and then you combine the whole thing. Um, and and uh, another thing, another variation has been uh, that people here been looking, okay, okay, suppose that the uh, information retrieval part is done, and now I just need to do kind of the, 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 the matching, right, the ranking. Um, and and uh, so, um, they actually found out that in the evidence sentences that they find, there are keywords like the rumor saying, uh, has spread over years, it's just a groundless inference that, blah, 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 things like this, which actually are, are uh, quite relevant for, for uh, you know, I mean, those are just additional things that you should probably kind of uh, ignore and focus on the rest and, and kind of do the matching in a smarter way. So basically they are, they are doing these kind of patterns, trying to learn those kind of patterns with memory networks and, and they're you know, like trying to match, uh, um, to do the matching, right? Um, taking this into account. Um, there has been work that goes beyond English. So uh, uh, um, they have been uh, data sets of, of uh, uh, of, of claims in, in, in different languages, pairs of claims, and, and, and they have kind of, uh, you know, some labels for similarity. Um, okay. and, and, you know, they have been running some kind of uh, cross-language uh, representation. Uh, so like XL and Roberta or Laser or Wapsi, those are three different uh, uh, kinds of uh, embeddings. Um, okay. Um, any questions so far? I don't see any question in the chat. Yeah, okay, I also don't. So, okay, let me continue. Um, and let me now go to fact checking, right? I mean, so, so um, uh, you can solve the task of, of a fully automatic fact checking, maybe in uh, two different ways. One is uh, evidence based fact checking. So you have a claim like the Rodney, King, uh, the Rodney King riots took place in the most populous county in the US. Um, and uh, maybe you have some evidence base, which can be different things. Uh, let's say it's Wikipedia. Let's say you, you trust Wikipedia or you trust Reuters or you trust something, right? So what you want to do is you want to build a system that is going to do a lookup there and uh, is going to find relevant information 
it is going to tell you based on this information whether this is true or not. And it's also going to give you evidence for this, right? It's going to tell you, look, I found those claims and uh, here it tells me that uh, Rodney King riots, uh, you know, occurred in the Los Angeles County. And here's another sentence that tells me that Los Angeles County is the most populous county in the US. And from those two pieces of evidence, I can say that Rodney King Christ actually took place in the most populous county in the US, something like that. Um, and uh, so those kinds of systems are returning uh, the pages and, and also the, the, the sentences, you know, parts of the sentences that are, you know, relevant. And, and, and uh, this is good because those systems are highly accurate and they're also highly explainable because they can tell you why, how they came up with this and you can actually judge, right? Um, uh, the problem is that they assume that the, the information is fact checkable with your knowledge base and they require a sufficient additional evidence, right? So, um, and I mean, you cannot fact check like this every single claim. Suppose that the claim is, oh, there was a bomb, uh, you know, uh, uh, two minutes ago in whatever street. You probably are not going to find this in the, in, in Wikipedia or in, in knowledge base because it just happened, no? It's only there in social media. So how do you fact check those kinds of claims, emerging claims? Well, you, uh, um, have something like, okay, you know, coronavirus, uh, you know, it's, it's just like a cover up for the 5G uh, syndrome and, and whatever kind of some conspiracy theory, right? So, and, and you, uh, I mean, the first thing is like to look into the source, right? Can I, can I trust this source? Um, and then you want to see, and you can, you want to find uh, other reliable sources. Are they, um, do they agree or disagree with this claim? Um, and and uh, this is another task like stance detection. Um, and and uh, you uh, might want to know what are the, the reputable sources, what are the trustworthy sources here. So that's another task, right? Kind of uh, source reliability. Um, some of those might be posted or retweeted and whatever by trolls and bots. You might want to detect this as well. And um, so you can really collect a lot of information this way. Right, and you can put together evidence from different places. Like, uh, okay, is this coming from a reliable source or not? What are other sources saying about this? Do they agree or disagree? Are they reliable? Is, are they trolls, bots, and stuff like that? Um, the problem is, I mean, and, and, and this really means that you can fact check many more claims. I mean, a larger variety of claims, because if somebody posts something in social media and says, uh, yeah, something. Uh, you can monitor also kind of what people say, how people react to it, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, the problem is that it's kind of much less explainable because you just put all this information together. <clears throat> and each of these sources has, has a certain kind of vote and you have certain kind of certainty in, in, in those labels. And, and uh, really it's, it's, it's kind of not so, so uh, uh, it's, it, it gets potentially less explainable, right? Uh, but, but you can fact check many more things. Okay, so let me start with fact checking claims using Wikipedia. I have uh, uh, put you this. And, and, and here really we have um, uh, some high level distinction between explainable and, non, and, and kind of more explainable and less explainable fact checking, let me put it that way. So uh, one way to do explainable fact checking we have already covered. It's like to find that the claim was previously fact-checked by fact-checking organization and return this page, no? Another one is to fact-check using Wikipedia or, or tables, statistical tables, Wikipedia tables, and so on. You can fact-check against knowledge graphs that are trusted, right? Uh, um, and, and uh, you know, um, and then there, there, uh, uh, um, um, kind of non-explainable, non uh, 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 kind of less explainable uh, fact-checking that, that we're going to cover afterwards. So let me look now into uh, fact-checking using Wikipedia pages, right? So, I mean, this, they, they is the, this is the, the formulation of the fever task. Um, so they have a very large data set of, 
quite a few claims, so they have like 80,000 for uh, and plus 30, plus 35. Uh, it's, it's actually close to uh, 200,000 claims that are manually annotated. And, and uh, uh, um, as uh, supported, refuted amount of information. So basically they were giving people Wikipedia pages and they are telling them now make up a claim, you know, and uh, about this page and kind of say which sentence and which part of it is about. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, say whether this was supported or not, not enough information. Um, and uh, so a system like this works like this. So you start with a claim. If you want to fact check in against Wikipedia, first you need to find the relevant documents. Um, um, I mean, maybe the document retrieval tells you, okay, he's uh, a list of uh, most similar documents to the claim. Then it's a classifier or something to tell you, okay, those are sufficiently similar to the claim and those are not. And after that, you need to maybe chop those uh, documents into individual sentences and you need to decide for each sentence whether it's it's a good match against the claim or not. And, and uh, you know, kind of again, kind of have sentence retrieval and then selection or matching or ranking. And finally, you, uh, based on this information, you try to make a classification for the entire claim. Uh, support refute or no enough information. And um, so one way to do this is uh, this kind of just one model. There are many models that have been proposed in the literature. Uh, uh, here, uh, they are um, building semantic level graphs. And uh, the way that it works is, okay, so here's your claim. The Rodney King rights took place in the most populous county in the US. Then you find two different pieces of evidence based on the information retrieval. And then in one sentence, you find that the Rodney a connection, you establish a connection between Rodney King Rights and Los Angeles County. Um, and in another sentence, you establish a connection between Los Angeles County and most populous county in the US. And uh, you also have cross sentence links between Los Angeles County and Los Angeles County. And then you have links uh, between the entities here and the claims here in your original thing. And, and, and basically uh, uh, you um, do this, you do this sort of kind of semantic role labeling and the semantic parsing uh, to identify those uh, uh, parts of the sentence and you get a few of graphs and you reason over graphs. And I don't really want to go into much detail here, uh, but, but uh, yeah. So there have been a more recent uh, versions of, of uh, Fever Right, uh, okay. Um, Fever 2.0, they had uh, something about build it, break it, fix it. So the idea was that um, initially people were building systems to solve this. I give you a claim and you need to tell me whether it's true or not. And after that, they had a second part of the competition where they asked other participants to generate adversarial examples for the systems built in the first part of the system participants uh, of the competition, which means they you, you have to find examples that are going to break the system, kind of inventing examples. And then, and then there was a third part of the competition, the fixers, fixing part where um, those adversarial examples were given to the people that were building the uh, original systems. And they were told, okay, now uh, here are some examples that are breaking your system. Can you, you know, uh, improve your system based on this additional information? And, and this kind of, you know, you can imagine this, this is a cycle of building, breaking, fixing, uh, even though they just had one iteration of that. Um, and and there, there are more recent uh, iter uh, iterations of the task where, uh, for example, last year, uh, they, they were combining fact-checking using uh, text from Wikipedia, but also tables from Wikipedia, okay? And actually fact-checking using tables, I mean, okay, without text, just the tables, right? Uh, uh, is, is something else that I want to tell you about. So um, um, there was uh, a collection uh, put together uh, 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 from, you know, you can find it in the Start Fact website where they have uh, 16,000 tables from Wikipedia. And uh, so they ask people to annotate statements, to create statements about those data set, those tables, and they created 118,000 statements about those tables. And the statements can be, I don't know, there are three different incumbents from the Democratic Party, for example. 
uh, yeah, there are one, one, two, three, right? So, so uh, you know, and and and, um, and there, you know, uh, some are okay. This failed to be elected. Uh, Dow being on a post, John Mac, John McPhail, uh, actually he was reelected, right? Uh, and he says it failed to be reelected, even though being on a post. Um, actually, Struid he was on a post, right? You see here. But uh, he was actually reelected, right? So, so stuff like that, um, and and uh, so basically, given tables like that, right? You maybe maybe you know kind of in certain formulations for the task, you know which table this is about, and you have a claim, and you just need to say whether this is true or not. Um, uh, the claim about this table, and of course, uh, what you need to do is you need to somehow. Uh, you know, select uh, important things in the in the in the in the data set, and you know, kind of, uh, um, and and then do a certain kind of kind of reasoning, which requires also certain kind of aggregation. Uh, uh, so, um, and um, and then and then, um, so the way that the task was actually uh, solved. It was really converted the table. Okay, suppose that you have a system that is going to select for you the, the important, uh, uh, the, 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 the interesting uh, um, rows that are relevant for you. And now you want to encode this information. And basically the way it was done, this was actually uh, converted into uh, something that looks like natural language text. Okay, so for the three, 2009, for the three to four. So this is some kind of the kind of game, right? And basically you convert this into something like row one, game is 51, semicolon, date is February 3rd, 2019, you know, semicolon, Florida, and so on and so forth. And and uh, yeah, this this kind of what you you know what you what you uh, do and then then you 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 kind of uh, uh, concatenate this and, and together with the claim that you care about. And, and, and you also kind of think of the position and, and, and the type and so on and so forth. And then you make inference based on that. Um, and that's table word. And they have been other, other people, uh, this kind of more from the database community, uh, which were interested in fact checking uh, specific kinds of claims. Um, and those are numerical claims. So for example, he says in 2006, 17, global electricity demand grew by 3%. Okay, and now you want to understand whether this is true or not. So first you need to understand that this is about the table, global electricity demand. Then you need to understand that um, this is comparing year 2016, 2017. Um, and, um, you know, you need to see which column you want to look at. And then you want to kind of see uh, which formula you want to apply because growth of demand is, is uh, you know, uh, something like that, just a certain kind of ratio. Um, and and uh, um, yeah, they kind of had claims like this and, and they actually made them, uh, uh, you know, work by, by focusing on, on those kinds of uh, uh, specific numerical claims. Um, and, and probably the last explainable way to fact check is to use a knowledge graph. Okay, and, and uh, in a knowledge graph, uh, you have information in structured form of, of entities and relations between them, um, and, and maybe this Yagori is DBP, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, when a query comes, like is uh, whether Sari Khan is a mayor of London, you can go and you can directly ask the knowledge base whether it is a mayor of relation between Sari Khan and London. Um, you might want to. Um, in addition to this, not just use the knowledge graph, but also kind of go and parse documents and extract maybe uh, uh, triples like that um, and, and, and use this additional information. And then you might also want to use rules that are putting certain piece of information together. For example, if you are a citizen of something, you know, if you're a mayor of something, then, you know, something is capital, something, whatever. I mean, maybe you're a citizen and stuff like that. I mean, for example, if you are born in a city and the city is located in a country, then you are born in the country, something like that. You know, if you are born in uh, 
London and London is in England, then you know you're born in England, something like that, right? And th those are the kinds of, 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 of rules that you might want to put together. And and yeah. So um, and then yeah, they have like systems that are doing this uh, uh, and that can again uh, it's kind of explainable because it can tell you uh, how it came up with this conclusion. It can tell you, okay, I use this rule and uh, you know I use this uh, statement that came from the knowledge base that UK is a capital of London and I also have that Sadiq Khan is mayor of London. I found this in the text, something like that, right? And you put uh, those things together. Okay, so now we can move probably a little bit into the fact-checking claims using the text only. Right, using the, the plain text. Um, and uh, so there is this uh, popular uh, uh, classic data set, wire, wire, pants on fire, where you have 12,000 uh, claims from PolitiFact. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically what they have is uh, something very simple. They just get the claim and then you have some metadata about who did it and, 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 and who, who, what kind of person it represents. So for example, he says uh, it's never below zero. I don't know, uh, let's say the growth of the economy or, or whatever it is. Uh, and Trump and he's a Republican, right? And, and, and then we have some convolution of neural network. And, and, and of course, at the time they were not transformers. So, um, I mean, this is just like, just based on the text of the claim and who says it, can you predict whether this is true or not? Um, so now a little bit more, more uh, involving is uh, um, actually looking into perplexity. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is to use really language models for the task. And um, the idea is this. Suppose that uh, I, I pick a topic, let's say COVID-19, and I want to know whether something is true or not. <clears throat> so what I do is I go and I collect a lot of uh, statements about uh, COVID, I mean, a lot of I go and collect many documents, right, um, about COVID-19 and uh, um, that are reliable, okay, that are maybe, you know, from trusted sources or, or, or you know, from trusted journals uh, or, or, or whatever, right, and, and I built a language model. And then um, what I do is uh, when a new test claim comes, I just ask the language models, what is his perplexity, which is how much, um, um, how surprised this model is from this claim. And um, so, and, and the, the idea is that if you have something like the main way the COVID-19 spreads is through respiratory droplets, this would be similar, similar kinds of things probably would have been set in the, uh, you know, trusted documents. But if you have 5G communication transmits COVID-19, that's something that probably you have never seen something similar in the uh, uh, documents that you use to train the language model. Um, and therefore, the perplexity of this one is going to be very high and the perplexity of this one is going to be very low. And uh, then you can put some threshold and say, okay, uh, those that are higher than sort of threshold, the model is so surprised by them, they are so strange looking for a model that, uh, you know, that's probably, uh, you know, false and, and so on and so forth. And, and here are some other examples, right, of uh, uh, um, claims that have high perplexity and low perplexity. And actually the title says it all, right? Misinformation has high perplexity. That's a paper from NACA last year. Um, and, um, yeah, there, there are other ways to fact check claims using language models. So uh, actually there is this very interesting work on um, language models as knowledge bases. And uh, the idea is that um, you, you, you have, um, okay, in, in the classical knowledge base, right? You, you have, uh, uh, if you want to check whether Dante was born in Florence, you just need to go there and search for Dante and search for Florence in the graph and, and check whether there is born in relation between them. And as we said before, maybe you can also kind of have some rules that are 
allowing you to establish this connection via the third node or something like that. But, but that's kind of more or less what you do, right? And the kind of query that you can ask is like Dante was born in, and then you ask X. So basically, okay, Dante, you get the born in, and you check, where, you know, where is Florence. But actually, with language models, you can do this, you can check, ask the question where Dante was born by saying then Dante was born in and mask and ask the language model to predict the mask. And the idea is that if it's trained on a lot of uh, you know, reliable information, maybe, uh, or for example, on Wikipedia, maybe uh, what you would start predicting here is something kind of worse. So, or, or if you have like a list of candidate cities, maybe you can ask, not that Florence is on the top, but kind of as high as possible, something like that, okay? And, and uh, yeah, you can use this for fact checking. For example, if you have a claim like Tim Roth is an English actor, you can start like masking different words and see whether the model can recover this word or not. And uh, yeah. Okay. And of course you can fact check uh, using information from the web. So um, here you start with a textual claim you're going to retrieve uh, relevant, potentially relevant articles. And then for each article, you predict whether this is, uh, uh, you know, supports or refutes the claim. And then you kind of somehow aggregate this and uh, maybe taking into account who is the source of these claims. And, and, uh, and then you come up with a decision whether this is true or not. Okay, <clears throat> something else uh, about uh, fact-checking, right? So you can fact-check uh, the answers to questions in community question answering forums, right? And there was a task for that. Um, so um, of course, if you want to fact-check the answers in a forum, the, the, there are actually two steps. The first one is you want to check whether the question is actually such uh, for which you actually expect to have verifiable factual claims, because the, the question should be asking for a factual answer. For example, if I say, what is the penalty for jumping on the red light, which is kind of, you know, like for passing on red. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, uh, this is, this is uh, asking for, for, for uh, you know, a factual uh, claim. And, but if I say, uh, uh, can you recommend me a good vet in Doha? That's about an opinion, right? This is not uh, for you, this is a good vet. For me, it's not or the other way around. This is a matter of opinion. Um, or uh, or it can be just like things that are not really, what was your first car? This kind of really about socializing. Um, um, and and uh, now if you have a specific kind of factual claim, uh, a question like by how many months I can extend my visa, uh, then you might say, uh, Okay, see, there are different answers. Some say nine months, some say six months, right? And, and, and I might want to see which of those are true or not. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the way that you do this is uh, you want to look into the answer content. Who is saying what and how? Um, and, and who is, I mean, uh, no, what is, what is being said, right? Kind of look into the answer, you look into who is saying it, you look into how other people react on the forum and maybe kind of additional information from the entire web and you put all this together. Uh, and, and you can also fact check claims about images. And uh, so there are different situations. You can have like a real image and the true claim. So for example, this is true that this is a Tesla in, in space. Uh, Elon Musk did that at some point. Um, um, or you can have like a fake image and a false claim. So for example, here we have, uh, you know, Putin tying by the, by the tie of Barack Obama. So uh, this claim is not true, this never happened. Uh, and this image actually is manipulated, right? They are just talking. Um, and, uh, um, and you can have a case where you have a real image, but the claim is false. So for example, he says, oh, it's a palm sized rabbit but actually that's not a real rabbit as a toy, right? Something like that. Um, and yeah, you might want to fact check the claims about uh, the, the images and you can kind of go and you can collect data. For example, in snoops.com, there's a photography section which has uh, claims like that about images. 
Um, and uh, uh, you can look for different things. You can look whether the image was manipulated um, or you can do reverse image search, which means I take the image and I do a search in a search engine um, and I collect the, the, the results and I check whether they appear on good or on bad websites and uh, um, uh, you know whether and, and then I also want to see whether they support the claim or, or, or don't support the claim stuff like that and um, so um, yeah I don't need to skip this in the interest of time but uh, you know kind of there, there has been other more recent work on, on photography detection with, with explanation um, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, and the final kind of uh, fact checking that I have been telling you is uh, that is also kind of my experiment is like in social media, right? And, and uh, there's this very early work from 2011, uh, uh, very highly cited on information credibility in Twitter where they have been talking about the four sources when you want to decide whether information in Twitter is credible or not. So one is the message, what does it say? Then the user, who is saying it? Then the topic, and finally the propagation, how it spreads. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and about the message, you can do all kinds of things, what kind of punctuation, emoticons, hashtags and stuff. Uh, and many other things. I mean, remember this early work, they are not transformers, they are no, so this is really kind of more like keyboard, keyword based and pronouns and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, the user, you know, some information about it, how is verified account, does give URL and so on and so forth. Um, and then, uh, you know, the topic uh, uh, and, and finally the propagation how many tweets, retweets, how deep is the tree, you know, and, and stuff like that. And how, how, much, how much branches and stuff like that. And of course, if you look into uh, the content, uh, uh, the, the, there are other things that are actually kind of interesting, right? So uh, uh, you can um, look into uh, um, certain kind of specific phrases, right? And, and how they are uh, uh, appearing in, in social media. So for example, um, in rumors versus non-rumors. So see, after, after a certain period of time, people start saying false or fake or, or asking what and really, right? Or kind of say it's rumor. Why for non-rumors, uh, you know, this doesn't really happen, right? So, and, and, and this kind of some, again, early observation is 2016, and people have uh, operationalized this, let's say, uh, using uh, um, recurrent neural networks, and of course, now you can use transformers and so on and so forth. So, they can track these things over time. Uh, so, in terms of uh, uh, checking the rumor veracity, there have been uh, shared tasks on this. Um, um, and uh, one of them is the Semeval uh, 2017 plus eight on, on, on uh, rumors. Uh, and then there's this 2019. Um, and uh, so the task is this, you have a claim, uh, basically you have a topic and then you have a claim, uh, uh, let's say Vladimir Putin, you know, is that, and stuff like that. And then you go and you uh, check kind of, you, you have a, an entire tree of comments um, and, and um, um, you need to uh, see, you know, this tree of comments where it kind of, you know, agrees or, uh, or disagrees and so on. So basically here um, you, you have like a source tweet that says that, you know, he is that, and, and then you have like um, some support you know, this kind of abstract claim, uh, some query it, question it, right? Some, some kind of comment, comment on it, um, uh, and some disagree with it, okay? Oh no, he just has plastic, he just, he's just having plastic surgery or something like that, right? And, and, and based on this entire tree, I mean, first of all, one task is to label every single uh, node, and the other task is kind of to make a prediction for the uh, entire subtree. Uh, and, and about the veracity of the claim. 
Um, so you can do also fact checking using information from multiple sources. So uh, something uh, important here, relevant is the claim review project uh, launched again by the Duke Reporter Swap. So they have been uh, developed a schema, the claim review schema, where um, any fact check organization can actually publish their uh, uh, fact check claims um, in a public repository uh, that, that actually uh, you can search. Uh, Google actually has a search engine for this. They have APIs and stuff. So it's really, really nice, right? And, and it's also in different languages. Um, and uh, those guys, uh, we have uh, um, actually developed uh, an entire uh, uh, kind of have part of this information to a knowledge graph in the claims PG scheme. Hmm. And I can show you the statistics, right, from there. So some other kind of multi-source uh, data sets are the MutaMC, uh, which has uh, different kind of, of, of uh, um, information from different sources. And, and, and something that is very interesting here is that uh, here's the number of claims. And you see again, different kind of distribution, right? For some of them, we have 15,000, from some we have just 71. Um, but then interestingly is the labels, the name, number of labels in the classes. And see what kind of variety, it's not just true and false, right? It's like in between, in the red, in the green, and he's like correct, incorrect, mostly correct, unproven, misleading, understanding, exaggerated. Or, or here we have 27 different labels for this one. Fiction, truth, unproven. Truth and fiction, mostly fiction, non, disputed. Truth and misleading, authorship confirmed, mostly true, and stuff like that. See, inaccurate attribution. So, and those guys here have like four Pinocchios, three Pinocchios, two Pinocchios, false, not the whole story, needs context, non. So it's really, really, or a lot of baloney, a little baloney, some baloney. Um, so, um, and, and, and uh, uh, we, we really kind of have, have uh, uh, yeah, quite a lot of, of um, different uh, labels. And uh, one way to model this is, okay, one way, how, how do you learn from all these data sets if they have different labels? Wait, well, one way to do it is actually to say, you know what, I'm going to, um, um, map them somehow, right? But map them to what? I mean, map them to two labels or to five labels. Mm -hmm. um, um, so the the um, the alternative is to uh, actually kind of they, they have in this paper they have a nice idea to say you know what we are going to do label embeddings, which means that okay you have the claim, you have the evidence pages, you have the metadata, we're going to make here a prediction where this is true or not. Uh, but um, so um, what you know they are going to do is actually is uh, uh, they, are, they are kind of doing uh, label embeddings, right? So kind of they are trying to um, to see uh, whether <coughs> they, they are trying to to to, to learn uh, dense vector representations for for, for the labels, and uh, then the model internally. Uh, what is the, the relationship between them? And then at the end of the day, when you predict, you just mask and you just see, predict the label that you want from the inventor that you want. So which means that the model works with all these labels, but you say, give me one of those three, right? Because they, they, they match this source, something like that. And here's some uh, survey on this. Um, and uh, they have like fact checking uh, uh, efforts in the public health domain. Um, um, so, uh, which was using information from schools, PolitiFact, and so on, but also kind of from trusted uh, sources like Associated Press and Reuters and, and, and the Health News Review. And, 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 and they have like data sets. Uh, I want to kind of. Uh, skip this. Uh, they have like interesting multilingual data sets, right? And and um, so actually let me see. I mean this is very similar to um, to, kind of to this. Raslav, we have yes. five minutes. Maybe we should try to yeah. okay. Yeah. 
so uh, we kind of, I mean, we have here the 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 um, a nice multilingual uh, data set, right? Exfat, which is you know quite fresh from last year, uh, where they cover a number of languages um, um, from different language families and so on from different uh, fact checking websites. They actually don't have that many claims, though. They have only nineteen thousand claims, and if you think about it. Um, I mean, in different languages, but only 19,000. So if you compare here, um, for example, this Mute FC has 36,000. Okay, this 185,000, those are from the fever. So uh, one issue here is that those are not natural claims. Those are claims that don't come from fact checkers, but they are coming from people that are asked to create a fake claim. But, uh, yeah, several others. So. Uh, but it's quite good because it's it's from from different uh, uh, and maybe I can stop here. So we cover fact checking. We didn't really cover fake news detection, but um, I think this is a nice. Uh, actually, this this tutorial has a nice prefix property, uh, which means that it has uh, several different sections, and it's always possible to, you know, uh, and they're arranged in a way that it's possible to. Uh, you know, to stop. But to have some conclusion, I'm going to skip over this and I want to have some conclusion sites, right? Um, and so maybe very quickly, they are kind of also neural fake news. We didn't cover much of that. Um, and and uh, um, so those are kind of the deep fakes. That's about images. Um, and, and this also kind of text generators with GPT-2, GPT-3. Um, and uh, uh, you can go and you can try it for yourself in Talk to Transformer or Grover, uh, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and one way to detect this, how do you detect those? Uh, one way to detect this is like that there's certain kind of uh, inconsistency in between uh, potentially between the, 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 the different sources, between the text, the photo, and the article, the caption. Okay, to conclude, question, can we win the war on fake news? And the, the answer is that it's a complex problem, right? Uh, and it is the cooperation of social media uh, and the tech companies on which platforms most of this is happening. Certain kind of legislation, maybe acts for kind of pressure from the government can be helpful. Um, and uh, um, but then the journalists, high quality journalism, fact checking, this is very important. And 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 finally, uh, uh, we researchers can develop different kinds of tools to detect it or to uh, you know to help in this problem. But really, the the uh, the one one solution that is uh, interesting and kind of has been proven to work is uh, uh, media literacy and critical thinking, uh, uh, teaching people. Um, what is fake news, how to detect it, and, and you know how to check it quickly and stuff like that by themselves. And, and uh, this is somehow proven by now to work uh, in Finland. Um, and of course, Finland has some of the highest media literacy uh, rate, kind of has the highest media literacy rate according to a 2019 study. And there was another one two years later, uh, which also confirmed that. Uh, they're also famous for the education system. Um, and uh, yeah, so maybe we can finish with this. Um, uh, we have to be careful about, um, you know, statements that are just facts, but they can be also different reflections of reality. They can be opinions, but they can be also different ways to look at the same thing uh, that are equally true. So for example, here's one example of that. And with this, we, I think I can end and take some questions. I don't see any question in chat, but at the moment we have only um, one, example. one person in the audience. So we might ask directly Alexander if he has any questions.
Okay, so um, then if there are no questions, maybe we can uh, finish here. Yes. Um, so thanks for uh, listening to, to the tutorial and we hope see you again in another conference.